Muy bien, pues hola, muy buenos días. Eh, bienvenidos a este seminario de, territorio de, la, de la Agenda Territorial 2030. Podrán eh, consultar el, el, el programa. La primera intervención de esta mesa inaugural de autoridades, a quienes agradecemos su participación, será la del conseller de Política Territorial, Obras Públicas y Movilidad, eh, Arcadia España García, que por motivos de agenda no ha podido participar presencialmente, pero que nos compartirá eh, el siguiente vídeo eh, con su intervención inicial. Muy buen día a todos y a totes. Buenos días a todos y a todas. Quiero empezar agradeciendo a Chimo Farinós, a la Cátedra de Cultura Territorial Valenciana y a Funditoc por todo su esfuerzo durante mucho tiempo por acercarnos ese conocimiento imprescindible a la realidad territorial de la Comunidad Valenciana, porque cuando uno conoce bien su territorio es cuando lo cuida y cuando lo quiere. Por lo tanto, esa difusión, esa labor de divulgación y análisis es fundamental para avanzar en el futuro con un crecimiento sostenible y adecuado de nuestro, de nuestro territorio. Y más aún el acierto de organizar esta webinar, esta jornada, en un momento clave para la Unión Europea, para España y para la Comunidad Valenciana, con ese presupuesto que va a ser el más importante de la historia de la Unión Europea, también un presupuesto de los más relevantes de la historia del Gobierno de España y también en el caso de la Comunidad Valenciana. Vamos a tener recursos, pero tenemos que hacerlo bien y tenemos que enfocar esos recursos dentro de esa visión tan importante como es la visión territorial. Por eso el acierto de esta jornada en esa implantación dentro del plan de recuperación y de la política de cohesión europea de esa visión territorial, de esa agenda territorial 2030. Estamos en un momento clave, como todos conocen, un momento en que se están acelerando muchos cambios. ...y que no, muchos cambios que no tenían el empuje necesario y que ahora lo tienen. Me gusta resumir en tres los retos que tiene la sociedad valenciana, española y también la europea. El primero es la lucha contra el virus, contra el coronavirus. Eso lo sabemos todos y en eso estamos haciendo un esfuerzo todas las sociedades para vencerlo cuanto antes... ...y ahora tenemos algunas luces de esperanza con las vacunas anunciadas. El segundo elemento es la creación de empleo, fundamental. Todo parte de la creación de empleo, de la riqueza que genera esa creación de empleo y es lo que mueve la rueda, es lo que nos permite pagar eh, la sanidad, lo que nos permite financiar la educación, las políticas sociales, las infraestructuras. El eje fundamental de nuestras sociedades es el empleo y por eso tenemos que crear empleo como uno de los retos más importantes en estos momentos. Y por supuesto luchar contra el cambio climático. Resulta fundamental no, tiene, no ha, desa ha desaparecido de los titulares, pero no ha des desaparecido de nuestras vidas ese cambio climático. Por lo tanto, tenemos que afrontarlo más allá de la notoriedad mediática que puedan tener. Y es ahí, en la superación de esos tres retos, donde la cohesión territorial a todos los niveles tiene un papel fundamental. A nivel europeo, a nivel de las regiones, a nivel de los estados y también a nivel de los ayuntamientos. Un concepto... El de cohesión territorial de la Unión Europea, que se introdujo en el Tratado de Lisboa, ha sido la base de la Unión y de, y de todos los países y regiones a lo largo de, de estos años. Y como se manifiesta, por supuesto, en la Agenda Territorial 2020, que será renovada en pocas semanas. La Generalitat comparte plenamente esa visión comunitaria y agradece el esfuerzo de la Unión Europea y el de muchos ayuntamientos por trabajar en esa Agenda Territorial. La política de cohesión territorial debe de saber conjugar dos elementos fundamentales. Uno es la creación de empleo y la sostenibilidad. Y debe de hacerlo de una forma equilibrada a lo largo del territorio. Es necesario superarlos en paralelo, esos tres retos que tenemos. El equilibrio territorial, el crecimiento económico y del empleo y la sostenibilidad medioambiental. Tenemos que superar esos re tres retos de la mano, con unidad y sabiendo que uno es interdependiente del otro. El propio Consejo Económico y Social, en su dictamen del mes de julio, también decía que no solo la dimensión de desarrollo, sino también la capacidad de resistir frente a riesgos difícilmente previsibles. Riesgos que pueden ser climáticos, debido al cambio climático que se produce, y también riesgos para nuestra salud, como es la pandemia. Por lo tanto, tenemos que conseguir un territorio fuerte, resiliente y estar preparado para estos shocks inesperados. Por tanto, creemos que la agenda urbana tanto la europea como la española, y en el, ahora estamos trabajando la agenda urbana de la comunidad valenciana, es un instrumento útil, riguroso y participativo. Tiene que ser, no puede ser de otra forma que participativo, con el fin de que nuestras ciudades sean cada vez ámbitos, espacios más saludables 
y también donde la prosperidad llegue a todos sin dejar a nadie atrás. Esas agendas urbanas que queremos que sean el instrumento de futuro del urbanismo. Estaremos los planes generales de la nación urbana, que tienen una lentitud que muchas veces no acompaña los cambios de las necesidades de nuestros pueblos y ciudades, tienen que verse acompañados por esas agendas urbanas más ágiles, más amplias y más mirando al futuro y a la agilidad en todos los procedimientos. Por lo tanto, tenemos una oportunidad, de todas las crisis siempre hay, siempre está el germen de las oportunidades, para acelerar esos cambios necesarios, para construir nuestras ciudades basadas en los vecinos y en las vecinas y no tanto pensando en las infraestructuras. Las infraestructuras siempre son un medio, no tienen que ser un fin en sí mismo. Tenemos que recuperar ese espíritu del derecho a la ciudad en todos nuestros pueblos, en todas nuestras ciudades y también en la concepción de los gobiernos autonómicos y el gobierno de España. Pero también una parte importante es la conectividad territorial. La movilidad es un derecho que abre la puerta a otros derechos, como el derecho a la sanidad, a la educación, como el derecho a las políticas sociales o al estudiar y trabajar. Y ahí también estamos en un cambio de paradigma fundamental que estamos impulsando desde, desde la Consellería para racionalizar y diversificar todos los modos de transporte. Tenemos que evitar que la única salida para moverse sea el vehículo privado. Tenemos que diversificar con las bicicletas, con los patinetes, con un mejor transporte público, con ir a pie. Tenemos que racionalizar su uso y diversificarlo. Una movilidad sostenible es un gran instrumento también para la cohesión territorial y también para luchar contra el cambio climático, como así se establece en el Pacto Verde, que es uno de los pilares fundamentales también del Plan de Recuperación, Transformación y Resiliencia del Gobierno de España. Por lo tanto, esa es una de las apuestas que queremos hacer y uno de los ejes de reflexión en la jornada que hoy inauguramos. En esa línea tenemos que trabajar y estamos trabajando desde la Consellería en mejorar el transporte público, alcanzando a final de legislatura la integración tarifaria. Llevamos muchos años de retraso, así como construcciones de nuevas líneas de metro en Valencia, en Alicante y también mejorando el transporte en Castellón. Esa intermodalidad que hablábamos, con ayudas también a la compra de bicicletas de que este año se han, han sido medio millón de euros y que también tendrán un importe igual el año que viene. Y también los planes de acción territorial que estamos impulsando. Tenemos que desbordar la óptica de que los municipios son islas, de que no hablan con el municipio de al lado. Tenemos que tener una óptica multidisciplinar y supramunicipal para poder afrontar estos desafíos que tenemos. Y que recuerdo brevemente dos cosas. Una es la palabra conjugar. Tenemos que conjugar soluciones para superar los tres retos y luego tenemos que hacerlos todos con unidad. La sostenibilidad, la creación de empleo y la lucha contra la pandemia. Siempre con esa visión territorial. Los grandes países crecen de una forma homogénea en su territorio, evitando zonas despobladas y zonas superpobladas. Tenemos que buscar ese equilibrio. Y esta pandemia que nos afecta es una oportunidad también para racionar ese equilibrio, conjugarlo con el crecimiento económico y con el medio ambiente. Muchas gracias y buena jornada. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Eh, a continuación intervendrá Ignacio Molina en sustitución de Francesc Xavier Boyá, secretario general para el reto demográfico, que no ha podido participar esta mañana por motivos de agenda. Ignacio, por favor. En segundo lugar, evidentemente, agradecer la, la invitación y, y felicitar por la por la ocasión para, para reunir en este, en este webinar un tema que nos parece fundamental, el de la Agenda Territorial Europea, vinculada a dos cuestiones tan importantes como son la, el plan de recuperación y, y la política de cohesión. Son aspectos, eh, en ambos casos, muy relacionados eh, y, que vienen, y que vienen perfectamente hilados al momento en el que nos encontramos, tal y como había señalado en el, en el vídeo inicial el, el conseller. Eh, es un momento clave, tenemos que afrontar desafíos eh, de muy corto plazo, muy intensos, que no esperábamos, nadie imaginaba el 2020 que íbamos a, a vivir, pero aquí está y, sin embargo, a la vez que tenemos que afrontar una crisis como nunca hemos, como nunca hemos vivido, a la vez se nos están abriendo ventanas de oportunidad, como en el ámbito en el que nosotros trabajamos, el del reto demográfico, no, no pensábamos tener en el corto plazo, sino más bien en el medio y largo plazo. Y eso es muy importante, la, la posibilidad de tener marcos estratégicos y marcos de acción alineados a un elemento tan importante como es la cohesión social y territorial. 
La cohesión social y territorial es el eje que guía la estrategia para el reto demográfico. La estrategia para el reto demográfico no es ni más ni menos que una guía, un pacto de voluntades para abordar la igualdad de derechos y oportunidades de todas las personas en todo el territorio. Ese es el reto demográfico. Garantizar que las personas puedan vivir libremente en el territorio y desarrollar oportunidades. Y en eso estamos trabajando, en un marco estratégico en el que colabora precisamente el conseller en, el, en, en la conferencia sectorial con comunidades autónomas y entidades locales. Queremos aprobar ya el, el compromiso que había desde 2017 de, de aprobar una estrategia nacional frente al reto demográfico, que no es el final del camino, sino precisamente el inicio del camino. El inicio que, que permita desarrollar la agenda, otra agenda, pero una agenda que sea demográfica y territorial a partes iguales. No se afronta el reto demográfico sin una visión territorial. Por eso decía al principio la importancia de, de, y la pertinencia de recuperar el concepto de agenda territorial en el marco de la Unión Europea. El cambio demográfico no es una cuestión española, el cambio demográfico es una cuestión global y que en el ámbito europeo es aún más intenso por cuestiones como los movimientos de población, el, los, los, los retornos, el, el, el movimiento de, de, la, de la población más formada, el envejecimiento, evidentemente. De, de esta manera, es esencial abordar el reto demográfico desde una agenda territorial y desde una agenda territorial europea. Es lo que pretendimos eh, en, en primavera de este año, cuando el Consejo Europeo aprobó eh, su informe, sus conclusiones del Consejo referidas a cambio demográfico las que se incorpora por fin ambas dimensiones. La dimensión de la estructura demográfica, hablar de los jóvenes, hablar de los mayores, pero también los problemas vinculados a la estructura de la población, al modelo de población en la, en la Unión Europea. ¿Qué hacemos con las regiones sobrepobladas y también qué hacemos con las regiones en las que hay un declive demográfico intenso y permanente? Que, como decía el consejero, ya, vienen, ya viene señalado como un principio fundamental en el Tratado de Funcionamiento de la Unión Europea. Tenemos la obligación en la Unión Europea de abordar los problemas derivados de, los, de las desventajas demográficas graves y permanentes. Ese marco estratégico, esa estrategia nacional, tiene que ir acompañado de un plan de acción. Y como decía antes, eh, es una oportunidad, tenemos la oportunidad de vincularlo a, a dos elementos que nos permitirán avanzar de una manera más intensa y más rápida. El primero, evidentemente... Por, por la urgencia y por el momento, el plan de recuperación, transformación y resiliencia. Se da una respuesta a la Unión Europea de unas dimensiones casi desconocidas. Estamos hablando de cifras, eh, en el caso español, estamos hablando de, de 70.000 millones de euros en transferencias más los créditos, eh, que tendremos que, que ser capaces de invertir en, en un plazo muy breve. Estamos hablando de un plazo de, de tres años para el desarrollo de proyectos y algo más para la conclusión de esos proyectos. Y que en el caso español, por primera vez, incorpora como un eje prioritario y un eje transversal a todas las políticas la cohesión social y territorial. Otra vez volvemos a la pertinencia de la, de la jornada y a la importancia de esta, de esta idea, la idea de la cohesión territorial como guía para la acción. De nada sirve un proyecto que avance en las grandes cifras, que avance en los grandes proyectos, de nada sirve invertir todo si lo que conseguimos es como resultado un país menos cohesionado en lo social y en lo territorial. Por eso es tan importante que todo el plan tenga una componente transversal de cohesión social y territorial. De esta manera, el reto demográfico no es una componente sectorial. El reto demográfico es un elemento que se incorpora a los 10 proyectos tractores del plan de recuperación y a todos los componentes, a los 30 componentes principales del, del reto demográfico. Se incorporan cuestiones básicas para desarrollar un territorio de oportunidades. Estamos hablando, por ejemplo, de, de la universalización de la conectividad de banda ancha ultra rápida y de, y, de, y de movilidad. Estamos hablando también de la mejora de las condiciones en las infraestructuras básicas de los municipios. Hablaba, hablaba el conseller de, de la agenda urbana, que el, que el plan de recuperación tiene que entender también que esa agenda urbana es para los municipios pequeños. No es solo agenda urbana de las grandes ciudades, también es la agenda urbana de los pequeños municipios. Estamos hablando también de oportunidades de actividad económica, transformación industrial en el medio rural. Estamos hablando de destinos turísticos sostenibles. Estamos hablando de comercio de proximidad. Estamos hablando de nuevas, de nuevas posibilidades vinculadas a la bioeconomía. Y también estamos hablando de servicios, de garantía de la prestación de servicios en el territorio. Economía de los cuidados en el plan de recuperación para las personas mayores. 
reforzar el sistema nacional de salud, no solo en las ciudades, sino también en el medio rural, y más después de la experiencia de esta pandemia. Y estamos hablando, en definitiva, de la transversalización. No podemos permitirnos que, que cualquier proyecto no tenga incorporada una perspectiva demográfica. Pero no, no por, por una cuestión reactiva frente al medio rural, sino por una cuestión de eficiencia y de mejor utilización de, de los recursos. En el medio rural hay grandes oportunidades. Y al mundo al que nos dirigimos, un mundo de descarbonización, de cambio climático, de transición energética, el medio rural es un ámbito no, no solo de coste, sino sobre todo de beneficio. Y por eso es tan importante el plan de recuperación. Y la segunda clave, la segunda oportunidad en la que estamos, es el marco financiero plurianual. Estamos hablando de un nuevo periodo de programación muy intenso que se acompañará y se seguirá de este plan de recuperación y que además nos ayudará a transformar a un, a un mayor largo plazo. Y ahí también el reto demográfico, en el marco de los objetivos prioritarios marcados en el semestre europeo para España, tiene que tener una clara componente para abordar el reto demográfico, para abordar los desafíos y las desventajas de los territorios despoblados y, y, y los territorios que, que, que sufren ese declive demográfico. Estamos hablando, en definitiva, de es el momento de tener clara una agenda territorial que nos ayude a abordar la cohesión, a la, la cohesión social y territorial. Tenemos claro que el objetivo de que el reto demográfico ha pasado a ser por fin una prioridad social, económica y política. Tenemos clara que esa, esa componente no puede desligarse de la dimensión territorial. No habrá reto demográfico que, a, que abordar si no, lo, si no lo vinculamos a los territorios. Y creo que tenemos el marco para generar nuevas oportunidades, nuevos proyectos, nuevos desafíos que, que, que contribuyan a, a dar la vuelta a este modelo que siempre planteaba la despoblación de una zona y la sobreconcentración de otra. Es una oportunidad y, y una jornada como esta nos ayudará a entenderlo mejor y a diseñar nuevas herramientas mucho más ajustadas. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Ignacio. Continuando con... Con la mesa inaugural le damos paso a María Dolores Pitar, directora del Instituto Interuniversitario de Desarrollo Local eh, y docente e investigadora de la Universidad de Valencia en el Departamento de Geografía. María Dolores, buenos días. Hola, buenos días a todos y a todas. En primer lugar, muchas gracias por haberme invitado a esta sesión inaugural como directora del Instituto de, de Desarrollo Local y como profesora de Geografía, como bien ha dicho mi pre, el que me ha presentado. Es para mí pues, un honor, una satisfacción realmente poder presentar la jornada que hoy nos reúne en este webinar. La Agenda Territorial Europea 2030 pues, es un instrumento valiosísimo, sin duda, para seguir trabajando y sustentando la cohesión territorial europea y fomentando, por supuesto, también la integración de la dimensión territorial dentro de las diversas políticas en todos los niveles de gobernanza. El impacto socioeconómico de la pandemia, del que ya se han hablado los que me han precedido, nos eh, presenta un panorama que está ya, ya suponiendo importantes desigualdades. Es incuestionable que los objetivos de recuperación, sin perder de vista eh, la hoja de ruta de la Unión Europea, pues solo podrán alcanzarse si se tiene en cuenta la dimensión territorial. Pues cada región, cada localidad incluso, por supuesto, tiene diferentes oportunidades de, de desarrollo y por eso también cada región está experimentando de manera distinta esta crisis pandémica que tantas vidas está truncando en todo el mundo. El Instituto de Desarrollo Local, con dos sedes, una en la Universidad de Valencia y otra en la Universidad Jaume I de Castellón, es un centro de investigación y especialización teórica y práctica en el campo del desarrollo local y regional, es decir, en definitiva, del territorio. Es nuestro objeto de estudio. En nuestro instituto desarrollan su trabajo expertos en las diversas temáticas contempladas dentro de lo que podemos denominar el concepto de desarrollo sostenible, marco de aplicación de las políticas y estrategias del enfoque territorial del desarrollo. Por tanto, el objetivo del instituto que en este momento yo dirijo es colaborar con entidades de diverso tipo, públicas y privadas, con el fin de crear sinergias que constituyan o que contribuyan, mejor dicho, a mejorar la calidad de vida de las personas en el momento presente, pero me importa mucho señalar esto también, también para el futuro, por supuesto. La intención no es en absoluto pretender imponer la norma de la academia en la sociedad, sino bien al contrario, aprender unos de otros, transferir en las dos direcciones, desde lo local, desde el territorio, a la universidad y viceversa. Se trata de crear conocimiento que sea útil a la sociedad y que con el enfoque de la sostenibilidad y de la gobernanza 
seamos capaces de innovar para mejorar, para afrontar con solvencia y de manera responsable los retos a los que nos enfrentamos. Ya se han señalado por parte de los que me han precedido, desde el cambio global al envejecimiento, desde la despoblación en el mundo rural, la masificación en las ciudades, el empleo, por poner algunos ejemplos. En este contexto, el enfoque territorial es muy relevante y la presentación en breve de la nueva Carta de Leipzig para las ciudades y la nueva Agenda Territorial 2030, pues así lo atestiguan. Las dos partes en las que está estructurado este webinar, este seminario online que ahora presentamos, una primera sobre los objetivos y oportunidades de la Agenda Territorial Europea y la segunda parte con la vista en el futuro, formas de avanzar en la nueva Agenda Territorial, nos van a ayudar a centrarnos en la necesidad de entender las características territoriales y el patrimonio local para avanzar hacia el futuro conectando redes, actuando de manera conjunta y coordinada. También se ha señalado por parte de los que me han precedido, muy importante este tema de las redes y la acción conjunta. De manera resiliente, en este momento tan crítico, hacia un desarrollo más equitativo y sobre todo más justo. Bien, la actual crisis, como también lo hicieron las crisis del pasado más reciente, enfrenta a Europa ante sus retos más acuciantes. Ya se han señalado, insisto, los retos demográficos y sociales, el cambio climático, los riesgos ambientales, el reto energético, el reto tecnológico, que aunque las nuevas tecnologías ya no son tan nuevas, siguen siendo alguno, un problema en algún, para algunas personas, para algunas regiones, o el reto vinculado a la pérdida de biodiversidad, de patrimonio natural, incluso cultural. Todos ellos tienen diferentes grados de gravedad en las distintas regiones europeas y a distintas escalas. Las diferencias entre centro y periferia siguen existiendo, entre áreas metropolitanas, ciudades medias y espacios rurales, en aspectos como, por ejemplo, la provisión de servicios, el mercado laboral, tan importante en el que hay que trabajar, y, por ejemplo, también en el mercado de la vivienda, en exclusión social, en calidad medioambiental, entre otras muchas cuestiones. Todo ello justifica sobradamente la necesidad de promover un desarrollo territorial equilibrado, sustentado por las economías locales sólidas que deben contribuir claramente a la mejora de la vida de las personas, que es al final lo que importa. La cohesión territorial sigue siendo un reto para la Unión Europea y los espacios de encuentro y de reflexión como el que hoy presentamos contribuyen definitivamente a avanzar en este propósito. Así que de parte del Instituto de Desarrollo Local solo me resta agradecer a la Cátedra de Cultura Territorial y a Fundicot por la organización de este webinar, de este seminario online. Gracias a todos por su asistencia y de entrada, por supuesto, ya enhorabuena por este seminario que ahora comienza, que seguro va a ser muy fructífero. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Madre Dolores. Por último, cerrará la mesa de ponentes el director del webinar, eh, Joaquín Fanirós, presidente de Fundicot y director de la Cátedra de Cultura Territorial Valenciana. Muchas gracias, Enrique. Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, gracias por estar a, eh, conectados ¿no? a esta iniciativa. Unas breves eh, palabras eh, con los pocos minutos que tenemos para mantener el horario del programa para darles la bienvenida en primer lugar y en segundo disculparles por el problema técnico que algunas veces las nuevas tecnologías pues, nos plantean de cara a la organización, que parece estar resueltos. Tres ideas eh, fundamentales me gustaría resaltar. Eh, la importancia del momento, como han referido mis compañeros de mesa, es decir, estamos ante una situación inédita, con una resolución y una voluntad política desde el punto de vista de los instrumentos y la forma de abordar los retos que tenemos planteados en esta situación ¿no? de cambio climático y de pandemia sobrevenida que nos está obligando a repensar el futuro y sobre todo a la forma de hacer política y de hacer políticas. Entiendo que estamos también en un momento especialmente significativo como es el de la aprobación de un nuevo marco financiero de la Unión Europea y en este sentido creo que empieza a calar afortunadamente esa filosofía que desde hace ya mucho tiempo empezaba ya en el año 89 con las primeras reuniones de los ministros de ordenación del territorio con la elaboración de la estrategia territorial eh, empezaban a plantearse la necesidad de un modelo para Europa. Ese modelo ha tenido, digamos, la plasmación en la idea de la cohesión territorial y en todo, todo el soporte instrumental, ¿no? reglamentario y, proced y proced 
procedimental para poder eh, llevarlo a cabo. Es muy importante, creo, eh, y esta es eh, otra de las cuestiones principales a destacar, la necesidad que tenemos para tener en mente un modelo, es decir, eh, qué modelo de territorio, qué modelo de sociedad qué modelo de vida tenemos que plantearnos para un próximo futuro. Y esto se quería hacer a nivel del conjunto del proyecto de Unión Europea, pero es un compromiso, como ustedes verán, eh, por parte de todos y cada uno de los estados y cada uno de los eh, diferentes niveles de gobierno, incluso de la propia eh, ciudadanía. Nosotros tenemos eh, que seguir unos parámetros, unas cuestiones básicas que guíen o que sirvan de tutor eh, para tomar las decisiones de las diferentes actuaciones que pueden ser programáticas o puede ser puntuales, ¿no? es decir, el tema de, lo, de las inversiones y los proyectos, que sin duda eh, son el elemento fundamental de la transformación territorial. Pero debemos procurarle una coherencia en base a un modelo de grandes principios sobre qué modelo de territorio y qué modelo de vida tenemos y cómo podemos contribuir de una forma organizada a cada una de estas administraciones y los actores civiles y también la propia, el propio sector privado de cara a la construcción de este pretendido modelo de futuro. En eso nos va eh, la calidad de vida y nuestra forma también de disfrutar de ciudades y de territorios. ¿no? Para ello pues, eh, se convocaba esta, esta jornada eh, con, con un panel de prestigiosos especialistas. Yo creo que tenemos la suerte de poder contar con todos y cada uno de ellos y eh, también pues, eh, quería, tenía la intención al, al organizar y al proponer la jornada, tratar de dar la posibilidad de que se muestre cómo esta agenda territorial que se va a aprobar su renovación el próximo 1 de diciembre bajo la presidencia alemana, cómo se va programando una serie de acciones piloto que entiendo deberían animar a poder eh, buscar alianzas entre los diferentes territorios y socios del conjunto de la Unión Europea para tratar de desarrollar esta idea que está detrás de esa agenda, que con un carácter tal vez más eh, intergubernamental responde a unos principios básicos de cohesión eh, que ya se establecían a través de la Comisión Europea y en los debates del Comité de Desarrollo Territorial en un ejercicio innovador en aquel momento que era eh, el Open Method of Coordination, que creo que en estos momentos podría o puede ser válido digamos que desde el punto de vista de esa gobernanza multinivel y de esa cohesión ¿no? que tendríamos que buscar para el conjunto de los territorios independientemente de las responsabilidades que cada uno de los partners pueda tener en cada momento. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Terminaré aquí para dar paso y no retrasar más la presentación del, del resto de mesas. De nuevo, pues eh, gracias a todos. Pueden plantear ustedes las preguntas y comentarios a través de la pestaña de cuestiones o preguntas en, 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 el, en la aplicación. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias, Joaquín. Eh, damos paso pues, a la primera de las mesas de ponentes, eh, Objetivos y oportunidades de la Agenda Territorial Europea 2030 para los territorios de la Unión Europea, la cual está moderada por Margarita Ortega, ex representante del Gobierno de España en Asuntos Territoriales y Materia y Paisaje en la Unión Europea, a quien le damos eh, voz para que pueda iniciar la sesión. Ya, ¿se me oye? Buenos días. Muy breve. Eh, muchas gracias a los organizadores por contar con, por invitarme y contar conmigo en, esta, en este seminario. Eh, y para mí es un honor por dos, eh, por dos motivos. El primero, porque eh, me, a, me, no, me emociona volver a tomar contacto con este proceso que es de, de introducir la dimensión territorial en las políticas europeas que se inició hace 20 años y del que yo fui testigo como representante de nuestro país en, en, las, en todas las iniciativas y aquellos trabajos que llevan a cabo. Y el segundo motivo también de orgullo y de, de honor es porque yo soy miembro de Fundicot, que es una asociación que ha venido siempre defendiendo este, este proceso y es uno de los referentes que existen en este país, precisamente para mantener estas relaciones tan complejas y tan, eh, tan a multinivel, por decirlo de alguna manera, pero con una idea eh, absolutamente clara, que es la que se ha comentado, de introducir ese, ese objetivo de la dimensión del territorio, del territorial y, sobre todo, el, ese objetivo de cohesión territorial que se introduce en los tratados. Bien, dicho esto... Eh, inicio, eh, se inicia esta, este panel 
con, con el, con, tenemos tres eh, oradores y el primero eh, al que le voy a dar paso es a, a Kai Boom, que eh, es un viejo conocido, bueno, viejo, él, él es joven, yo no, yo le conozco de entonces, que es el founder y director del Spatial Foresight de Alemania y nos va a hablar de lo, del largo y continuo proceso o, o camino, como él describe, que ha sido la agenda territorial para incorporar esa dimensión territorial en las políticas europeas. Kai, tiene la palabra. Thank you for the introduction and good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be invited to that panel while I share now my PowerPoint. So now you hopefully see my presentation. So what I would like to use the next 10 to 15 minutes is to yeah, think a little bit about the territorial agenda. And as Margarita already said, it has been a long journey. It's not that this is a one time and first time. And really, if you go back, it's 20 years or even a little bit longer, starting with the liberation of the ESDP, the European Spatial Development Perspective. And then came the first version of the territorial agenda in 2007, the second one in 2011. And now we will have the territorial agenda 2030, actually. Sorry, that's it. And then we, which will be agreed on Tuesday next week, hopefully. I think what we always need to keep in mind when we talk about these policies, even though we are talking at a European scale, it's an intergovernmental cooperation policy. So it's actually carried forward by the countries, by the EU member states and some neighboring countries, including, for instance, Switzerland and Norway. So it's not a EU as a European Commission policy, but really something that's carried bottom up from the member states. In the run up to the territorial agenda 2030 to be created next week, there were not only those policy documents from the past, but there's a lot of work behind that. In particular, the ESPON program has been very supportive with a wide range of research informing the territorial knowledge about Europe and a particular project run by a dear friend from Barcelona, Andrea Juliet from MCRIT was on the territorial reference framework that builds a basis for a lot of the analysis and discussions that led to the new territorial agenda. And basically that builds around three types of challenges. So what you see, and I think a lot of those challenges have been mentioned in the introduction speeches already, Europe faces, the world, but also Europe and its territories face particular challenges when it comes to climate change, to the loss of biodiversity, cultural and landscape, circular economies. So there's a lot of things that we need to address to really make sure we have a future and we're not risking our future with unsustainable developments in the different territories. Then we have a huge number of challenges that are linked to places in Europe drifting apart. And I think we've heard already about demographic change that is different in different parts. We heard already about employment, digitalization, all those things at the moment point at increasing disparities in Europe. And you have actually a discourse about a geography of discontent places that don't matter, which signals that we are more and more as people and as places drifting apart in Europe, in the countries, in the regions. And if we want to have a future, if we want to build on the success, we need to make sure that this is turned around and we are not further accelerating. And therefore also the member states and all the players involved in the territorial agenda agreed on the subtitle as a future for all places. So the territorial agenda really advocates that there is a future for all places, small places, big places, central, peripheral, whatever kind of place you are. And then the yeah, most recent and most dominant challenge in the game at the moment is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. And that accelerates a lot of the 
challenges we have. So it's just kind of putting an additional layer on increasing disparities on there. But I would like to argue that it also gives us an opportunity because as was mentioned, we now get a substantial EU budget. We have a lot of policies that frame the word of a restart, a recovery. So maybe that also gives us a chance to think kind of what do we want Europe to look like in such a restart? What can that be? And maybe there the territorial agenda can stress a little bit the territorial dimension. And, and in the territorial agenda, as it will be agreed next week, there are two main objectives. The one is really to advocate a just Europe that offers a future perspective for all places and all people. And the second objective is a green Europe that protects the common livelihood and shapes societal transition towards a sustainable development and economy. And if you look into the just Europe part there, it's three priorities. The one is on a balanced Europe, which emphasizes the need of a polycentric development across Europe, that we make use of the diverse potential that we have in different parts of Europe and that we really also cooperate on responding to global challenges. And that's the European layer. But then of course the territory has also several lower layers and here's the emphasis of the second priority was put on the functional regions, saying it's not just administrative areas, but really the functional region is very important to make sure that we have also there a cohesive and equality between places in a functional region and the emphasis here is on multi-level governance approaches and the strengthening of cooperation on long-term place-based strategies at local regional level and the third one under just europe is the integration beyond borders i think just the COVID example shows how integrated we are and that we need stable cross-border corporations and also coordinate different sector policies across national borders. So I think that is the part to ensure that we have a living and working across national borders in Europe. As for the green Europe, there are also three priorities. The first focusing on a healthy environment, looking at a better ecological livelihood and climate neutral and resilient towns, cities and regions advocating very much the use of nature-based solutions, the respect of our natural limits and the increase of resilience towards climate change, but also empowering local and regional communities to work with the protection, rehabilitation and utilization of their potentials in the environmental dimension. The second priority focus on the circular economy. I think that is very, very important if we move forwards in Europe, we need to have place-based, regional, local, industrial symbiosis processes that build up towards circular economies and strategies in the regions, but also embedded in a global economy. So it's not about dismissing the global dimension. And of course, it links very much to the innovation capacity that we need. And last but not least, our sustainable connections. That was a very highly discussed topic. I think there's a general agreement that we need both, and now we see that today again, good internet connections with high speed fixed and mobile communication access, but we also need the physical transport and particularly here's a link between the local regional transport lines and the transnational ones. But in part, and that is why it ended up under the green Europe, we need to make sure that both the digital and the physical connectivity is sustainable so that we have a shift towards more environmentally progressive modes of communication and connectivity. That are basically the priorities which the territorial agenda advocates and would like to see taken on board at all the different levels of governance. And I think that's where we then come to the implementation and governance part. And as I said, it's intergovernmental cooperation. So the territorial agenda cannot say we write that into any kind of EU treaty. It can only advocate, argue, ask that this is done. And it's really 
advocating that this is done by all players. So from the local and regional to cross-border, transnational, intra-regional, to member states, neighboring countries and the EU level. So it's not that we can sit here and point at somebody else and say, well, they should do something, then we do it. But it's really everybody is asked. And it advocates that this is done in a place-based approach that we look really at the territorial impacts of various sector policies, be it planning, development, transport, environment, you name it. And that we address the dimension of multi-level governance and good governance. The quality of governance is very decisive for territorial development. And of course, the cooperation between territories that we don't do things in isolation. And what the territorial agenda makes very clear is it's not saying you should do something extra. It's not you do an extra project and you apply for extra funding, but it's that everybody should take those things on board within the own regular mandate. So within the activities and policies you're doing anyway, people are kindly asked to take on board those things so that it's more transversal integration. I think if you look back for the last 20 years from the ESDP in 1999 to today, we see actually that in quite a number of policies, the territorial dimension progressively has been integrated. It's not a one big step, but compare how policies looked like in 1999 and today, and you find many, many more references towards territorial dimensions towards territorial disparities and sensitivities. So from that side, I'm quite optimistic that we actually manage. And we had in parallel to the elaboration of the territorial agenda colleagues from EPRC in Glasgow and Blue in Munich, looking at quite a range of different ongoing projects. Because they say, well, well, those people didn't know the new territorial agenda when they started working, but when we see what they do, they're actually very well doing it already. And they try to see why do they do it? And why do they say that is important? And the four main topics are basically they say there's a strategic territorial focus. So looking into that, that helps very much getting the projects better and policy integration and synergies and the cross-cutting issues across different policies that combine support and that allow for synergies are very important. And also innovation and experimentation. So taking it from a territorial perspective, you often needed to rethink a little bit. You needed to innovate your policy development and experiment a little bit. And I think that is in particular now when we move to a post COVID or living with COVID society, we need probably to dare to experiment and see what really are the good approaches and the good things we want to have. And as the territorial dimension is so strong on the cooperation and multi-level governance part, it helped quite a lot in the governance models and capacities. So there is actually also a benefit for everybody when you look into trying to follow the ideas of the territorial agenda and the previous versions. And again, here they use the same 52 projects they analyzed and simply said, okay, if we say balanced Europe, functional regions, integration beyond borders, healthy environment, circular economy, sustainable connections, that's those priorities. And they said, okay, at what geographical level did those activities, projects actually work? And as you see here, you see it from on the left, local over the regional, national, cross-border, transnational. So which simply shows that a lot of those things can be applied really at any geographical level. It's not one particular level. You find all the details in a report on the website of the territorial agenda. And I will then close with that as well. If you go to that website, www.territorialagenda.eu, you find as of Tuesday, the final version of the territorial agenda, both in a long and a short version, you find information about those 52 example projects and about the six pilot projects, which I understand will be presented and discussed in the 
second panel by colleagues from the ministry in Germany. So from that, I, I would say I leave it here and really a lot of information is available on that website. Thank you very much. Gracias, Kai. Has introducido, se me oye, has introducido dos temas que van a ayudarnos a las siguientes eh, intervenciones. La primera es que has determinado, bueno, has determinado, has señalado esa, esa geografía del descontento que lleva, el, que lleva en este momento la, el territorio, pero eh, la, la, el futuro de todos los lugares. Y eh, Fernando Medeiros, el Geography Professor del Instituto Universitario de Lisboa, justamente nos va a ayudar a entender cómo esa dificultad o esas posibilidades de introducir esa dimensión territorial, la territorialización, algo así, de eh, la intervención de esa, ese factor clave en las políticas, eh, de, en la política de cohesión de la Unión Europea a través del instrumento que nos ha esbozado CAI. Fernando, tienes la palabra. Thank you, Margarita. Good morning, all of all. I'm trying to put my presentation. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the invitation made by Professor uh, Joaquin Farinos and to make the presentation on this very interesting event and I think very relevant topic of the Territorial Agenda 2013. As you can see from the title of this presentation, uh, I will mainly focus on potential links between uh, you know, the presented Territorial Agenda 2030 that uh, Kai Wen presented and the, the cohesion policy. So um, as a geographer, I uh, know I focus on uh, territorial analysis and I sometimes, many times, notice that uh, this territorial dimension of policies is widely misunderstood, especially by policymakers, but also by some academics. Uh, but uh, in essence, um, let me see if I can put my presentation. Okay. In essence, uh, this territorial dimension should be analyzed uh, not only by the policy strategic goals, which should focus mainly on this uh, idea of territorial development and cohesion, rather than what, you, what we normally see, which is economic growth. And, but also on their potential territorial impacts, not only the impacts on economy, on society, on environment, but everything, and uh, including spatial planning, uh, territorial governance. So territorial impacts is very holistic, very complete. And finally, policies should target different territorial levels, as Kai Wen has shown in his, in his presentation very well. So um, in some, this degree of territorialization of policies um, depends a lot on the a strong territorial intervention strategy, uh, focus on development and cohesion, um, and also on high levels of expected territorial impacts. If you don't produce territorial impacts that are expected, then there is, this territorialization is not very strong. And also uh, it should be operationalized um, in all territorial scales, not only at the local level, but also at the regional, at the national, at European, and so on. And as uh, Kai Wen spoke at cross-border, transnational levels. So um, this increased territorial policy approach it should touch all this territorial universe, as you can see here, is quite vast, um, it, which, which I call the territorial EC of policies. We see the process of incorporating a territorial driven policy design to policies. And here you can see uh, many examples. Uh, we not only see the crucial and known policy goals such as territorial development and which, with all its dimensions and, 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 and territorial levels and also territorial cohesion, but also many other um, aspects of territorial EC, which is the improvement of territorial capital, the promotion of territorial governance processes and territorial cooperation, not only cross-border, transnational, um, territorial planning, or which is the Latin term of spatial planning, you know, that is used by our Anglo-Saxon colleagues, and uh, territorial integration, and also the implementation, of course, of territorial impact assessment process at, se at several stages, not only 
um, exposed after the policies are implemented, but also during these policies implementation through the midterm and also before they are implemented, the uh, exam that are third one back to assesses. So um, where does EU cohesion policy enters in this territorialistic process, which links the implementation uh, with the territory agenda? Well, as uh, it was recently discussed in the Open Days to 2013 workshop on the territory agenda 2013, this agenda does not have a budget. It doesn't have uh, money. You know, territorial agenda is an idea, is um, a strategy, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't bring money with it. So, um, one possible sources of funding is um, the cohesion policy, and uh, as it was mentioned by the Portuguese Minister for Territorial Cohesion. Uh, there's a, a predicted 30% of um, cohesion policy funding post-2020 um, that are due to be applied to implement these territory agenda goals, in particularly in the areas of environmental related policies. So this is one uh, possibility to interlink the territory agenda and, um, and uh, the design of the strategies of the national strategies and regional strategies um, um, for each country. Uh, for uh, uh, applying EU cohesion policy. Uh, indeed, if one relates the, um, these uh, three main pillars of, um, of, um, uh, of the main pillars of cohesion policy that are predicted for uh, post-2020, we can see a, a sea of possibilities to link these with the Tory territorial universe. Uh, you can see possibilities, for instance, the spatial planning that will be financially supported this connected Europe goal, and the territorial cooperation process can be financed or linked to uh, Europe closer to the citizens' goals. So there is a link here between all these territorial aspects of policies and the, the main objectives uh, for a cohesion policy post-22. But I bring here five main ideas, um, which, which I developed in a synthetical way. Um, first of all, uh, I propose this idea of favoring the concentration of funding in medium functional regions in less developed territories, you know, um, one of the um, one of the um, conclusions that we can take from the implementation of uh, cohesion policy all across Europe, not only in Portugal and Spain, but in all the countries that I've studied, like Sweden, Norway, and Finland, um, is that um, cohesion policy has been crucial to achieve the goal of territorial development. It has improved territorial development process in all regions. But it hasn't helped to achieve territorial cohesion at the national level. So um, the, the presented idea is that um, instead of putting all the money in all regions, in uh, you know every municipality has its own swimming pool, um, we should concentrate money, um, most of the money, the bulk of the money, the bulk of investment in, in these uh, medium towns in the less developed regions. Um, and here are uh, the example of for Iberian Peninsula, which was uh, a suggestion that is uh, made in a, in a paper. And uh, there is other, other countries that I've studied. Um, another suggestion is to ring fence innovation uh, funding to promote cir circle economy, which is predicted in the territory agenda on renewable energy production. And you can see here again, the example of um, Iberian Peninsula, which is um, a lot of potentials in, uh, in the solar energy photovoltaic production, which is still very largely untapped, especially in the south of Portugal. Maybe Spain is far more advanced than Portugal on this, but this is not to be done on, 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 on the countryside. It's mostly to be done on urban areas. Here, here the potential of city uh, of Lisbon in, 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 in the, the capacity to produce so, uh, photovoltaic or solar energy um, in so many areas. So um, this is another uh, example of where this money should be uh, used of cohesion uh, policy to implement um, uh, the territory agenda goals. Another example uh, is to promoting cross-border integration by the implementation of cross-border planning. Yes, the territorial agenda, uh, uh, as Kai Boem expressed uh, uh, the idea and the, the goal to promote this cross-border integration. But I think this should be a little, uh, a little step further, which going from cross-border integration to cross-border planning strategies. And here's another example um, that you can see in Iberian Peninsula where you already have a lot of transnational cooperation, cross-border cooperation uh, uh, entities like GTCs and rural regions that are implemented in also rural cities. 
that could be um, the, um, the, the entities that could boost these cross-border planning processes um, to achieve the goals of territorial cohesion. So um, the fourth, um, also an, another example uh, here I just show that these uh, cross-border planning strategies should not cover you know, the regional areas, but it should be concentrated on the border. So you need to delimit well, where is the cross-border area to implement these strategies so that they actually make these positive impacts for the border region and not for the rest of the regions. Um, another uh, aspect that Kai Wam spoke, you know, that sustainable integration, uh, but at, at the transnational level, it's also very important to focus on these transnational aspects of planning. For instance, it is hard to plan a functional high-speed railway system in Portugal, which we don't have yet, without taking into consideration what the one that is already implemented in Spain. This is a fundamental aspect of, of, of um, uh, territorial development uh, and to help to achieve territorial cohesion in many, in many regions is to have this transnational perspective of investment. Um, I could speak a lot about this, but there is no time. So we move for uh, the last one, which is also something that is already being implemented here uh, in Europe. There is around 700 uh, sustainable uh, urban integrated development strategies uh, being implemented at, at the moment in Europe. 108 uh, around um, in Portugal alone. So many are still being implemented, but the first evaluations uh, have seen positive impacts of these um, sustainable urban integrated development strategies. And I present here the example of Barcelona. Um, they have seen very positive impacts in uh, the renovation of many de uh, de um, uh, deprived neighborhoods in, in these cities where they are being implemented, not only in physical renovation, but also in uh, socioeconomic and environmental rehabilitation. And uh, so I would say that this is a very good example when a lot of money should be um, concentrated to achieve these goals of the territorial cohesion at the urban level. However, um, 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 just like it happened with um, these deprived urban neighborhoods, you can always contribute in many cases to mitigate urban development and planning needs. Hence, there is a need to increase the channeling of funding to these uh, strategies. So I leave you here with five uh, arenas in which I believe um, the territory agenda could be implemented through the investments, through the money that is allocated to cohesion policy in all countries. And I, I uh, thank you for uh, uh, watching my presentation. Um, so. Obrigado. 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 Obrigado, Fernando, por esa eh, interesante análisis, interesante análisis de los efectos de esa consideración del territorio en los años que llevamos aplicándolo a través de la política de cohesión para abordar eh, la, el, nuevo, el nuevo periodo y esas cinco eh, interesantes ideas de las que espero Luego en el debate podrás, eh, digamos, ampliar eh, algunas, eh, eh, algunos de esos enfoques. Gracias. Y ahora me gustaría darle ya la palabra a um, Angélica Paz Monegue, Moneguele, que es la directora ejecutiva de los asuntos europeos del de Consejo de, del Consejo de Municipios y Regiones de Europa. Yes, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, sorry, I first need to turn off the, the translation. Otherwise, I think there's a problem. Yes, okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the invitation and it was really a great pleasure to re uh, accept the invitation and it was interesting to listen to the previous speakers. Uh, in particular, I'm very happy to hear what the representatives of the Spanish uh, government or administration were saying, because it really goes into the direction that uh, we want the territorial agenda to be uh, applied and to be uh, understood. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I would be interested to receive the PowerPoint presentations of the previous speakers because there was so much information in it, it would be interesting to have a look at them again. Uh, my presentation covers three points. Uh, the first one is a, a few, are a few reflections on the territorial agenda. 
And then I would like to address the opportunities, but in the third part, also the challenges that, uh, that we see. But before I start with these points, I would like to shortly present the Council of European Municipalities and Regions, what we are. Uh, it's the European umbrella organization that represents national associations of local and regional governments. So in Spain, uh, our member is uh, the FEM, the Federation of uh, Municipalities and Provinces. Uh, we are member, or we participate in this intergovernmental uh, uh, work uh, on territorial cohesion, uh, and uh, this, uh, this 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 group uh, has been involved in the preparation of the territorial agenda of 20, 2030, and already in the previous one on the territorial agenda 2020. We, and myself as well, we were involved and I very much appreciate the work in particular of Kai Böhme and his colleagues. It was really a very interesting uh, way to jointly uh, address these questions and it was a very enriching uh, experience. Uh, I was very happy, or we are very happy, that uh, the principles that are uh, laid down in the territorial agenda, uh, we can fully share these and we should fully support them. In particular, the concept of polycentric development uh, and the focus on small and medium-sized uh, uh, towns. This is definitely something that, the, uh, that our members are uh, supporting because, as you know, the majority of uh, uh, local governments in Europe is not the big cities, it's not the metropolitan cities, but it's, uh, it's the smaller and medium-sized -sized towns. So looking at the territorial agenda 2030, what is really very important for us is that it clearly uh, uh, develops the, uh, the, the concept and, uh, and, and the idea that in Europe there's a future for all places. And this relates also to the uh, no, no place should be left behind, how we understand also the uh, 2030 agenda from the United Nations and the Sustainable Development Goals, which for us at the, at the CMR uh, provide the framework for our work. It's extremely important to follow this uh, perspective. No one, no place should be left behind. Uh, therefore, we are strongly convinced that the territorial agenda 2030 is an extremely relevant uh, policy framework uh, that really covers uh, many aspects that should be taken into account in the development and in the implementation of future policies. And I was very happy that the previous speaker uh, now referred also to the uh, territorial impact assessment. Um, I, I have the pleasure to participate in the uh, in the platform uh, Fit for Future, which had its me first meeting yesterday, where at the European uh, Union in, in level, uh, the task is going to be to assess um, the the relevance of of, of uh, EU policies. And my point was indeed to say it's not just an ex an ex post evaluation. It's in particular necessary to have this ex ante and the impl uh, during the implementation phase to monitor the impact on the territories. And I was very happy, Professor Maderos, that you mentioned it in, in, in your intervention. And I hope that we will be successful uh, with this. I got some support uh, from other uh, participants, but as I said, the meet first meeting took place yesterday. I hope that we can continue uh, working in this direction. Uh, so I would say for, and, and I'm, I refer also to the previous speakers from Spain, the territorial agenda is extremely important at this stage where the pre preparation of the next policy cycle in the EU is, is going to, well, has already started, in particular as far as cohesion policy and the recovery plan and resilience facility uh, is concerned. And we really hope that uh, member states, uh, national administrations uh, will take the, 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 the inspiration from the territorial agenda uh, for the for the development of the national plans. Uh, what is important for us, and I think Kai Böhm in his inter, uh, presentation uh, highlighted this as well, three points that are important that are mentioned in the territorial agenda, in particular the recognition uh, that we need better understand uh, and adequately address the territorial impact of uh, social uh, of, so, of sectoral policies. This is extremely interesting and extremely important that this is uh, 
better taken into account. Second point is, of course, the vertical and the horizontal coordination and collaboration. Uh, Kai also referred to the uh, impact of COVID-19 on the, on the territories and OECD in its uh, report that they prepared on, the, on this issue, the, ter the territorial impact of COVID, one of the key findings is also that it's relevant to that all levels of government uh, and actors at all levels collaborate uh, in order to tackle the problems and the, and the crisis. Uh, so it's also important, as has been mentioned, I think also by Professor Maderos, uh, that the diverse policy sectors and societal groups need to be associated and included uh, in this process. And last point, which I think is extremely important, in particular talking about the local and regional level, what is necessary and what we've seen also in, from, from, the, from the cohesion policy, what is necessary is capacity building uh, at the subnational level. Uh, uh, the need for exchange of knowledge and experience, good practices, networking, innovation, as you've mentioned, and Kai Böhme mentioned this um, report that is going to be published in, in the context of the in, informal ministerial meeting next week, uh, which has these uh, concrete pilot projects or concrete projects. I think this is, should be really a, a source of inspiration for others. Looking at the opportunities for local and regional governments, uh, my, my second point, uh, it's really very important and I hope that our president who will be speaking at the ministerial meeting next week uh, will, will stress this element, really call the central governments to apply the recommendations of the territorial agenda 2030 in this important moment of the preparation of the programs and the projects uh, for, the for the relevant EU initiatives. At the moment when we uh, consult our colleagues, our member associations, but also the Committee of the Regions uh, is doing that, uh, we are not too optimistic that this is really happening. So on the contrary, many countries, many national administrations uh, do this in in isolation or not necessarily in consultation with the national, with the regional and the local government level. And I'm pleased to hear, I was pleased to hear that in Spain, uh, the, uh, the attitude or the approach is different. Uh, it's really very important for the cohesion policy, also for rural development. Uh, we know that uh, rural development is in, in the responsibility of, uh, or is, is a part of the European agricultural policy, but it should not, uh, be ignored and it should really get more attention and there is a uh, currently uh, a consultation and the Commission is going to prepare a, re a, 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 a report uh, on the future of rural areas. So this really needs to be uh, looked at in, co in, 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 uh, in combination with the urban development. And of course, as, we, as I said already, uh, the national recovery plans currently under preparation uh, it would be extremely important to uh, take um, the territorial agenda's uh, recommendations on board. Uh, to mention also, of course, the European Green Deal and also the European Semester, uh, which are closely linked to the, uh, to the cohesion policy and the, and the recovery plans. Another thing, and I'm, it's not just to please you uh, uh, as researchers, but I'm seriously and, and dedicated uh, and, and convinced that uh, researchers, uh, academics, and, uh, and practitioners, local politicians, but also administrators should uh, talk to each other and should learn from each other's experience. Uh, uh, and our collaboration or our experience, for example, with ESPON is extremely useful and, uh, and very much appreciated because it really helps the uh, political, uh, the decision makers at the political level to, uh, to, to see the big picture and to understand the, uh, what's happening in, uh, in the territories. So I'm, I'm a strong uh, believer and a strong uh, advocate for an exchange between uh, the researchers and the, and the practitioners. Uh, and again, uh, also what, as a result of that, of course, uh, to exchange knowledge and, uh, and, and transfer the knowledge, it's not sufficient to have a list or a, 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 an overview of 32 concrete projects, but what is important is really also to see how can, the, how can other uh, regions learn from that experience. And we are also participating in the URBACT uh, program, which is particularly looking at uh, 
uh, uh, exchange of knowledge and experience at of the urban level. And I think something similar could probably be uh, launched also for, in general, for territorial development. I think it would be extremely interesting and useful to have something like that as well. My last point is the, ter uh, is the challenges. Uh, and uh, I'm really concerned, or we are really concerned whether the territorial agenda will be taken serious in central government administrations and in the relevant ministries. That's also based, of course, on the experience of the previous territorial agenda, Territorial Agenda 2020, also a very useful, very interesting document, but hardly anybody knew about it or uh, made use of it. So I think it's extremely important that next week when the ministers meet and adopt the agenda, that they also commit to uh, take it serious and to promote it uh, uh, towards their, uh, their colleagues in the other ministries. As Professor Medeiros already mentioned, and I, I'm quite happy about that, uh, also very important is, of course, the cross-border dimension, cross-border, transnational, international, uh, interregional cooperation, uh, looking at functional areas, going beyond legal and administrative borders, uh, is extremely important, but extremely difficult. We know from experience uh, that uh, still in many regions or in many, uh, in many local and regional governments, there is this uh, attitude only to think about one's own uh, territory or one's own uh, uh, unit. Uh, it's extremely difficult to, to cross these, uh, uh, these barriers and to cross these frontiers and to collaborate. Uh, also already mentioned by Professor Medeiros, <laughs> Medeiros uh, of course, the link between urban policies, the new, urban, uh, the new Leipzig Charter and the territorial uh, agenda, the, two cannot, uh, the one cannot uh, be uh, implemented or, or, or taken uh, into practice without the other. So it's really, really important. And another challenge is, of course, uh, the capacity at the local level uh, to participate and to contribute to the, uh, to the implementation of the, uh, of the territorial agenda. I hope that we at the CMR can contribute by mobilizing our members, by uh, stimulating uh, uh, the knowledge about that, that we can contribute to that. But I hope that uh, it will be a joint effort of all the relevant uh, actors at all levels, so central government, regional government, and the local level. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Angélica. Um, creo que has eh, ya apuntado eh, en tu intervención unos temas más interesantes para eh, sacar eh, para sacar eh, sentido a este seminario como es el, el, la posibilidad el, la participación desde las escalas locales y regionales para implementar en el territorio estas nuevas orientaciones que proporciona la agenda eh, me gustaría agradeceros estas tres intervenciones y eh, preguntar, plantear un, un, tres grandes ideas para eh, que pudierais responder. Creo que ha habido una, en general, eh, una, una orientación de la situación eh, que pese, o, o gracias a, tal vez a los efectos de la pandemia, sin embargo, esta situación crítica se percibe como una con optimismo de cara a reforzar la idea de, la, de lo que es el enfoque territorial, que es eh, advertir la situación crítica, pero también abrir oportunidades a todos y cada uno de los territorios. Creo que ese es un, eh, es un tema que pone en valor el papel que tiene que hacer la agenda para ayudar, no es efectivamente un tratado, pero sí es una, tiene una vocación de servir de orientación al nuevo periodo que se abre de fondos y además también a los fondos de reconversión. El segundo sería ese enfoque. Yo creo que ha habido eh, muchas ideas muy interesantes, sobre todo que todo el mundo tiene que, que, que colaborar, que hay que hacer algo. Es decir, no basta, no, no, no viene de arriba. Es decir, hay una participación eh, enormemente potente en este caso y Angélica mm, 
es, eh, digamos, la, la, la que ha definido o defiende esa, esa óptica desde esos eh, poderes locales y regionales que están encima del territorio. Y por último, se ha enfocado, eh, o sea, se ha hablado de que hay que hacerlo de otra manera, que hay que reforzar determinados, eh, determinados aspectos eh, que son claves a la hora de, este, de esta necesidad de que esta agenda sirva en efecto de orientación. Y yo creo que esos eh, tres aspectos, el, esa necesidad de hacer algo y hacerlo para el futuro, es la, la, lo que me gustaría que ahora eh, vosotros reforzarais de cara a sacar unos, eh, digamos, un, un, unas conclusiones que ayudaran a, a resumir eh, vuestras aportaciones. Gracias. Ese esfuerzo extra para vincular la idea, el concepto de la dimensión territorial que, ha, que Fernando Medeiros ha explicado, eh, digamos, eh, cuáles han sido sus efectos, eh, o en qué se tradu debería traducirse, eh, yo creo que esa es una idea interesante, pero sobre todo, cuáles serían en este momento esos puntos que, An que Angélica nos ha reforzado en su intervención, que hace falta, primero la difusión, el compromiso y la responsabilidad a la hora de abordar esos planes que ya no son planes, de una, digamos, um, estándar. Tienen que ser claramente enfocados a esos territorios problemas que el análisis de la política de cohesión ha advertido. Es decir, esos espacios más débiles o más frágiles o esas relaciones más frágiles y más débiles que se han visto de la aplicación, quizás, de esas políticas, a lo mejor las sectoriales, que sigue sin comprender o pues siguen eh, dificultando esa versión transversal. Es decir, es un desafío absolutamente novedoso en donde interviene la palabra gobernanza, que hay que darle ese multinivel, que hay que darle verdaderamente sentido. No sé si es demasiado abstracto, pero simplemente es mm, eh, reforzar esas ideas. ¿Angélica? Uh, Kyle, Kai raised his hand. <laughs> I would give him first the floor so that I can think about, uh, think a bit uh, more about your question. Okay, then I jump in. Thank you very much. I think I would like to echo a few things Angelica said and well, has been advocating over the years as I know her. It's really also building the capacity at all levels of governance. So it's not only capacities at central or European levels, but in big cities, in small cities, in rural places, so that we really get the capacity to work with things because cooperating between places, cooperating across sectors, across levels of governance is not that easy as it is said. It's quite a difficult task and it requires a lot of capacity, not necessarily knowledge, but kind of how to handle it, how to work with that. I think if we really want to be successful with the territorial agenda and with territorial development in general, we need to think much more about that. So that is something I would really stress that we make sure it's not only the big metropolitan areas being able to capture those things, but all places as kind of a future of all places needs to address all. And for me, that then of course also links to communication. And if I think back to the last version of the territorial agenda, there was very little communication afterwards. So if nobody feels in charge to tell the world about it. The world will not know. So from that side, I also hope that after the ministerial meetings next week, we have the ministers in the different countries forwarding that information to their colleagues in the other ministries, to their regions and cities and municipalities. I'm a little bit optimistic here as, as it looks like 
at the moment the European Commission might step in and actually in spring next year do a translation of the territorial agenda into all official languages, which probably helps the communication beyond those that easily deal with English. So I think we need to make an effort, but I'm optimistic that we have a better starting position than what was the situation in 2011. And last but not least, and then I close, I would also say that the universities have to play a role, not just in the immediate communication and capacity building, but if we get the territorial agenda on the curricula for geography, for planning, for territorial development programs, so that future generations are aware of that. And I think that was my immediate reaction here. Sí. Eh, ¿Tienes algo que decir, Ángela? Porque ahora vamos a preguntar, eh, os voy a transmitir las preguntas que están haciéndonos a través del chat, pero sí me gustaría que respondieras, Angélica, y ahora ya comento. Yes, I would echo what uh, Kai was saying, but would I, go, I would go a bit further. Uh, I would like to echo communication is key, the role of universities, but I think what we also now see with COVID, the, rele the relevance of uh, uh, evidence-based uh, 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 arguments for to convince the decision makers. Uh, what we experience, or what I experience from my collaboration, I've been working at university myself, uh, is of course the language. How to uh, express complex uh, issues in a language that the politicians understand and also the 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 the, the public administration concern. Uh, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm afraid we don't speak the same language. Uh, universities or academics have the tendency to be very abstract and I'm not complaining, I fully understand that, but in order to bring the message across, uh, it's really important to have a language to use words which are easy, easily to, 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 to be understood by those who should, who should mm -hmm. uh, listen to the, to, the, to the academics. And uh, it's really about a change in the attitude and uh, we see it from integrated urban development for example how, how difficult it is to cross uh, dep from department to department so really to to mobilize people to talk to each other to develop something together not to continue in this sectoral approach it's extremely challenging and the same happens in in the ministry as, as we all know uh, one ministry in charge is not, uh, let's say, the finance ministry or the economic ministry. Uh, uh, if they are in the lead, they have difficulties to, to accept that others uh, have, uh, have a say on, on, on the distribution of the money. Or, or, so it's, and I think the, the, the importance would really be a, a, the political leadership. If there is a clear sense from the top to say, this is how we want to do it, this is how we are going to do it, then there is a willingness and hopefully also some, uh, some, some, some readiness to, to go in this direction. So that's why looking at the, at, the, at the draft conclusions for next week's ministerial meeting, it's still a bit vague. Uh, so it, it recommends, it proposes, etc. But what we really would need that it comes out from from the from the area of the ministries ministers in charge of territorial development and this is not the most important as we know but it goes really to the other ministries and all ministers in in an ideal world would accept it and say yes this is how we want to do it because we believe this is a good this is a good way uh, to proceed and here i think this is the risk that if it stays like that then it will not go further than the last territorial agenda. And that would be a lost opportunity. So I really think we need to see how we can mobilize politicians at all levels to say, yes, this is the way how it should be, how we should go and we support and this is how we are going to uh, apply it. Hopefully maybe in Spain, you have the opportunity to get the government in this direction and then to serve as a good example. And probably also in, 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 in Portugal, because you're, Prime Minister used to be the, the mayor of Lisbon, so I hope he has an understanding of the, of the importance of this. So if we get some, some support from, from a number of countries, hopefully others will follow. And of course, I have the hope that the German government 
would be in the forefront as well. Gracias. Gracias, Angelina. Eh, me alegra que incidáis en este tema porque me he recogido de las cuestiones que han planteado eh, las personas a través del chat esa misma idea. Es decir, hay todavía una distancia entre eh, la, las virtudes, el interés, el contenido de esa agenda que se percibe de una manera todavía abstracta por las eh, dificultades eh, de que las administraciones entiendan ese nuevo papel en unas circunstancias eh, diferentes que obliga esa gobernanza transversal de, de multinivel eh, que rompe de alguna forma con los sistemas convencionales y protocolarios, sobre todo eh, de las eh, políticas sectoriales. Es decir, se introduce unos factores eh, muy innovadores que son difíciles todavía de encajar y por tanto es ahí donde se ve la mayor dificultad que pueda eh, asegurar el éxito. No obstante, eh, el mensaje creo que sigue calando, de hecho que se perfile como una política, eh, la política de cohesión como mm, asegurar o tener como objetivo el ofrecer eh, que todos los territorios tengan su futuro ya es alentador y sobre todo entendiendo que precisamente las dificultades de las esas partes del territorio son las que eh, merecen eh, de alguna manera una mirada mucho más intensa para lograr ese equilibrio que se pretende, en definitiva. Me gustaría que Fernando en, eh, digamos nos ampliara esas, eh, esos cinco motivos, esas cinco ideas que parece que están, mm, que pueden responder o ayudar precisamente a estas dudas que nos están preguntando. Fernando. Thank you, Margarita. Well, uh, just um, before I uh, speak about that, um, I actually think that um, um, this uh, proposed territorial agenda 2030 um, actually thought about uh, to improve um, this communication, the, to pass the message to politicians, uh, because it looks like the strategy was designed in a way that is more simple than the previous ones. And I know, I think, I know that uh, the idea was exactly to pass the message in a better way, in a better manner than the previous ones did. And I think this is a positive thing in this new territorial agenda 2030. We need to thank the work of Kai Boem on this um, because the message is very simple to, for everybody to understand, I think. Um, when it comes to this, um, to make it more detailed, these uh, five proposals um, that I propose to link the cohesion policy with the territorial agenda, um, there is not really <laughs> that much to, to, to detail, but uh, the idea is to use it, the money in a smarter way, you know, because the, um, I've been evaluating cohesion policy since the first program, uh, since um, the early 1990s in Portugal. And um, the first periods of programming period, there, there is a lot of money, especially in Portugal, I think. Also, I've studied in detail the implementation of cohesion policy in Spain also. Um, the first programming periods, there's a lot of money going um, to feed many private interests um, and not the interests of the public. And uh, these have changed uh, a long time because the commission started to see these and started to impose better regulations, more regulations. It made the cohesion policy more bureaucratic. But um, in the end, um, if we don't have a strategy to uh, best in the money of cohesion policy into the right, in, in the right manner, um, then the impacts are always going to be the same. They're, they're going to be positive for development in certain regions, but not for all regions. And what I've seen based on all this experience is that the, the implementation of cohesion policy in the end, always favor the, mo the, the most developed regions. Um, the money goes always, and this is not just the case of Portugal in Spain, because I've studied in detail Sweden, and I've studied in detail, Norway is not part of uh, um, the EU, but they receive a lot of money, not from the EU, 
but they are implicated in uh, territorial cooperation uh, programs. So I've studied also Norway in detail. And in the end, the, 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 the regions, uh, the, the rich regions, which are the metropolitan areas, end up finding always ways to receive more money. For instance, um, if um, um, the Lisbon University cannot get money because it is in a competitiveness area, it links with the universities in less developed regions like in Evra and Alentejo and other areas and ends up get more money than those regions. And it's not only done in Portugal, it's done in Spain and many other parts. There's a lot of schemes um, because the capital, um, the human capital is usually in the big cities. And those are uh, the, where you have persons that are have the knowledge to capture these very difficult um, uh, money from the commission because it's so bureaucratic that you need to have this administrative capacity, this human capacity, um, and this knowledge to apply for these projects. So in the end, these uh, less developed regions, they all they always lose uh, when compared to the lower developed regions. As this first idea of having the concentration of funding on the, on the medium cities of less developed regions. Why? Because it's on the medium cities that you have the universities, that you have the administrative capacity, and if you distribute all this money like we have been doing in the past years for all municipalities, for everybody to have this little piece, it ends up not to have the impacts that we expect. And the idea is that if you concentrate this money on these medium cities that are already the development anchors of these uh, less developed regions, you could promote these spillovers all around the region and everybody benefits better from that. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a concept. It should, it should need to be applied to see if it really works or not. I think it would. Um, this is one of the first ones. Then, you know, um, I came from a country which has uh, developed a lot in terms of uh, investing in renewable energies. But still, still, uh, Portugal is still largely dependent and like many other countries in the importation of uh, fossil fuels. And um, only in a few days during the year, all the electricity that we use um, we produce via uh, renewable energy, which is usually a few days in the winter where it's a lot of rain and a lot of wind. We, are, we already have a lot of, uh, we Portugal, a lot of wind capacity, um, but uh, only a few days. I see no reason why we're not fully independent in energy production, uh, electricity, of course, in Europe. We don't need to import that uh, much uh, energy if we are smart and we invest uh, um, in uh, exploring this uh, uh, renewable energy potential. Because in Portugal and Spain, we have the capacity to be fully independent in, en in energy production via the sun. We have this capacity. It's not do done, should be done in, in the fields, but on the cities. Um, so this is the second idea, uh, which is uh, related to this circular economy that Kai Wem spoke about in the strategy of prison policy. Then it's the, the transnational cooperation, which is a very interesting um, um, domain of research. Um, and, and the cross-border cooperation. You know, one of the things that we've seen in this, uh, with this COVID uh, process is that um, it was not very smart that we closed the borders. I think that's one of the conclusions that I've taken all, all these studies. You know, cross-border cooperation is, 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 is fundamental to, to territorial development because these open of the borders that have been occurred since the 1990s in Europe, especially here in Iberian Peninsula, has created these interdependencies that are very difficult now to, to eliminate by shunting at, uh, at the border. And uh, I think this is one uh, idea that should be better explored in ter territorial agenda is that they speak about integration. I think the next step is planning. And uh, if we want to make this territorial agenda more formal, um, I think we should go to, to force um, countries to have cross-border planning, uh, transnational planning, because I give you an example of Portugal. Portugal didn't have any spatial planning um, documents at the municipality level before it was they were mandatory to do this to receive the fundings municipalities in the 1990s if they didn't have this the municipal spatial plan they didn't receive any funding all of a sudden everybody started to have municipal municipal plans in portugal so uh, they were forced to do it and this is something that the, the territorial agenda should force uh, to have these uh, cross-border plannings these transnational plannings to kind of force uh, from um, a legal point of view, um, the regions to cooperate, which is a difficult thing, like Angelica said, it is. But, you know, if you force them to do, to receive the money, because if you don't do this, you don't receive the money, they'll start doing it. 
Um, then, uh, you know, the transnational uh, planning I already spoke about. And finally, of course, Angelica was uh, very targeted and uh, this is our area on the importance of reinforcing these uh, integrated development strategies, which is, as Angelica said very well, it's very difficult to do. But if there is money, and this is one of the lessons from cohesion policy, if there is money, they will do it. They will do it because if, if there is money, you put everybody on the table, and this is how interact cross border cooperation, where there are people from many countries, from many regions. If they know, if they don't achieve uh, an agreement, they don't receive their part of the money. So they will do it if there is money. So if you force this a little bit more, and that is something that I'd like to see from territorial agenda, to kind of force countries to mand make mandatory for them to implement cross-border planning, transnational planning, integrated urban planning, they will end up find a, an agreement platform because it's the only way they can receive the funds. <laughs> Obrigada. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Fernando. Eh, eh, dos, eh, dos anotaciones. Yo creo que justamente las áreas fronterizas son, eh, a mi juicio, las que más eh, se han movido, precisamente, más han respondido a esa necesidad de cooperación. Es decir, ha sido un efecto, uno de los mayores efectos que se pueden comprobar, pese a que necesitan todavía unas oportunidades compartidas, que es donde yo creo que está el problema. ¿no? Eh, la, la, la pregunta recurrente ya para concluir es que mmm, sigue, eh, digamos, eh, eh, la, la esperanza sigue pendiente de que las administraciones demuestren esa inteligencia, esa capacidad de respuesta para responder a esos nuevos desafíos ya la palabra planificación sería difícil porque eso es un compromiso, pero sí que no responda a, digamos, ideas o, o respuestas, eh, digamos, políticamente muy rápidas a ocurrencias, por decirlo de alguna manera, sino que respondan a un, a un hilo, a un hilo conductor, a algo que, que dé una garantía de futuro. Y para ello yo creo que en este, al menos en nuestro país, la... La Federación de Municipios y Provincias, que ha mencionado Angélica, eh, la, el fortalecimiento de las mesas entre las regiones para trabajar, eh, las mesas regionales para trabajar en las diferentes políticas, deben ser los lugares donde debe penetrar la idea de, que, que ofrece eh, la agenda y, sobre todo, de cara a que esos planes que se ha, que ha planteado que hay también, que deben ser formalizadas, estas estrategias a formalizar eh, respondan precisamente a objetivos consensuados y transparentes. Eh, creo que, no sé si tenéis alguna eh, palabra eh, última, eh, sencillamente yo me gustaría agradecer vivamente eh, haberos, el placer de haberos escuchado, de vuestro optimismo, de vuestra ilusión, de vuestras advertencias que puedan ayudar precisamente a conformar este nuevo eh, periodo que se abre y que, al cual no podemos fallar. Gracias. No obstante, me gustaría, si queréis, eh, dar algún último comentario, Angélica o Kai. Kai. Okay. Gracias a todos y retomamos el, el segundo panel que pasa ya a, a ideas ya un poquito más concretas y muchas gracias de nuevo. Gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, Margarita. Eh, damos continuación a, a la sesión, en esta ocasión con el segundo, la segunda mesa de ponentes, eh, Formas de avanzar en la nueva Agenda Territorial Europea 2030, que estará eh, moderada por eh, Joaquín Farinós, recordando a, a los asistentes que en esta ocasión para para la organización del posterior debate, deben enviar las preguntas del chat a, a Joaquín Farinós, a quien damos la palabra para que inicie esta segunda mesa. 
Muy bien, muchas gracias eh, Enrique, muchas gracias Marga por, eh, y a los ponentes de la primera mesa por esta interesante ¿no? eh, reflexión y compartir ideas, eh, propuestas e interrogantes ¿no? que yo creo que vamos a ir tratando de apuntar para, para darle continuidad en este, en este webinar, en la, en la parte de la mesa que ahora iniciamos como, como en, en un futuro. ¿no? Se han tocado diferentes temas, <coughs> espero que bueno, no, se me pueda oír bien estamos hoy aquí en el Mediterráneo con, con, digamos, con una tormenta así que espero que no, no, no tengamos eh, problemas de, 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 de podernos comunicar eh, y, de, y de oírme bien eh, a pesar de la contaminación acústica decía que se han tocado una serie de cuestiones eh, yo creo que muy relevantes ¿no? eh, se han tocado temas eh, como el tema de los fondos como el tema del lenguaje y como el tema de la aplicación. ¿no? Eh, yo creo que lo más importante, recogiendo una pregunta que planteaba Leandro del Moral eh, sobre la complejidad ¿no? de, del lenguaje, muchas veces el problema, decía, no es tanto la, la forma compleja ¿no? de, de poder plantearla, sino realmente las posibilidades del mensaje que encierra. ¿eh? Es decir, cómo se pueden concretar en una serie de actuaciones. Teóricamente las universidades, o digamos la reflexión en, en torno a las ideas, lógicamente parte de una abstracción de algo que existe en la realidad en este momento nosotros tirando ¿no? de, de esa idealización de, del modelo territorial te partimos o funcionamos en un sentido inverso desde eh, la definición de un concepto, de un, objet de un objetivo o de una trayectoria para ir plasmándola en la realidad. ¿no? Y eso nos lleva a la siguiente cuestión que yo creo que guía a la mesa de, de, de ponentes que vienen a continuación y es cómo podemos ponerlo en la, en la agenda ¿no? de la acción eh, pública ¿no? y eso se hace a través de una serie de proyectos o de líneas de actuación o de programas o acciones piloto concretas. ¿no? La verdad es que se propone ¿no? en esa forma de concretar e ir avanzando una serie de acciones piloto y una serie de propuestas que desde el punto de vista de las diferentes presidencias de turno de la Unión se han querido proponer para ir experimentando e ir avanzando de una forma, pues, eh, yo no sé si diría experimental, pero con la intención de plantear evidencias ¿no? y algunas eh, eh, lecciones que se pudieran compartir de las que posteriormente pues, eh, podríamos sacar alguna lección de cómo poder ir concretándolo. ¿no? Este yo creo que sería el fundamento de esta, de esta segunda, de esta segunda eh, mesa ¿no? de ponentes. Para ello tenemos a los representantes de... Eh, las presidencias croata con la intervención de Ivana Katuric. Tenemos también la representación de la presidencia portuguesa con eh, Ana Seixas y eh, finalmente tenemos a Daniel Melzian del, 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 de la presidencia alemana que cerraría la sesión de hoy. Por tanto, bueno, ya saben ustedes que pueden plantear sus eh, cuestiones. Creo que nos van a poder eh, ilustrar ¿no? con cuestiones concretas de cómo poder ir avanzando en algunas de las cuestiones que hay que tener en cuenta desde el punto de vista de esa agenda territorial europea y enlazarla con, con todo el, todos los programas de acción ¿no? que, que, que van a venir a partir de ahora con el nuevo periodo de programación, de lo cual pues, podríamos eh, extraer alguna, alguna idea de cómo participar, si eso es posible, poder involucrarse en estas experiencias piloto y, por otra parte, cómo poder ir eh, mejorando nuestra calidad de la acción pública y en, también desde las eh, diferentes administraciones y otros sectores de la sociedad eh, y de la academia eh, para poder continuar apoyando ¿no? el mantenimiento de, este, de esta filosofía de trabajo para dar coherencia a nuestras actuaciones. Por tanto, y sin más dilación, eh, doy la palabra a Ivana para que nos eh, hable de la experiencia ¿no? eh, croata eh, y cuál es la orientación eh, respecto de la, agenda urbana, perdón, de la agenda territorial europea que, en el caso de su país, pues, eh, tenían planteada. Ivana, cuando quieras. Um, thank you so much. Um, also, I would like uh, really to compliment you for this initiative. It seems to be really a punctual and a uh, good moment. Um, I'm going to show, uh, as uh, Tim already said, uh, briefly what we have done uh, during our presidency. And um, maybe um, what is also the follow-up because uh, now we can see uh, the results of uh, all these activities. So, um, the topics of creation presidency 
in the context of uh, territorial agenda post 2020 and um, they were related to two uh, groups so for the territorial cohesion group and for the urban matters group we had the uh, same topics and they were related to green infrastructure in urban areas and reuse of spaces and buildings in terms of the transition towards circular economy the, the background documents of course for um, these topics uh, are uh, here uh, also, uh, at that point, we had only draft territorial agenda and um, the 2020 and uh, post-2020, and we had only a draft Leipzig Charter. So there were still uh, really uh, documents which were going uh, forth and back uh, between different groups. And um, the topics that we have um, reached for and uh, further explored in depth, especially through ESPON policy briefs, uh, were um, somehow informing certain parts, certain comments that we have gave and discussions that we have uh, directed. So, um, concerning uh, the objectives, our topics were really uh, strongly related uh, to the um, main issues of um, European territorial management and the ideas of the reusing of spaces and buildings and zero net land take uh, achievements, reducing of urban sprawl and also the better management of urban land in general. So, um, the background uh, or the problems identified uh, in order to give the specific focus on them was the question of sustainable land use and um, this is also a uh, large ESPON project that um, uh, your university and uh, we are participating both in and it definitely informed the ESPON policy brief as well. So um, concerning the green infrastructure, it um, really relayed on the ESPON Greta project that was already conducted. But um, there is, of course, the um, mutual correlation between um, these two topics because, of course, the densifying strategies can't be truly implemented without the green infrastructure and nature-based solution um, teams. Uh, even more, uh, the um, specific focus that two urban agenda partnerships have created that is a partnership on circular economy and our partnership that you participate as well in as a respondents of the city of Zagreb is the sustainable land use and nature-based solutions. So these two partnerships, they have produced a very informative and very good uh, guide on reuse of spaces and buildings in terms of a transition towards a circular economy where they have identified the um, main processes ongoing, the um, uh, processes in which, for example, many cities are trying to establish agencies for a temporary use and uh, also uh, they were trying to understand the different scales of the circularity in um, economy of space, so in reuse of space. Uh, it can, uh, of course, range from a single building, from a building process towards the very big topics uh, that we are all dealing with, how to handle the urbanization in general, how to enter into the topics of the reuse of uh, brownfield sites within the city areas, and how to handle the densification policies. Uh, so basically, these were specific priorities of creation presidency, and um, our aim was, of course, to um, give a specific focus to those topics on the European level, also to um, uh, interfere with the drafting of the two important documents, so Territorial Agenda Post-2020 and um, Leipzig Charter, and uh, to um, at the same time um, also to um, uh, somehow um, uh, integrate uh, and test the applicability of those topics in relation to the new financial perspective, in relation to uh, different um, cross-sectorial axes that can happen. Uh, what um, we have experienced um, in, during our presidency was really um, a very good contact and a huge interest from many member states. 
Um, it was also uh, noted that the uh, introduction of this topic somehow steered the water in many, um, in many states. We were contacted intensively and we were discussing how to translate them in some operative documents on the national, regional level, on the urban level. So it was, um, it was very good and interesting experience. Uh, concerning um, ASPEN policy briefs, um, we really uh, found this um, interaction with ASPEN um, so good. It uh, focused the, the work that we had during the presidency, unfortunately. Um, it was in the middle of a COVID crisis, so our ASPEN week that was supposed to be held in Zadar was cancelled. And we were moved to um, sort of uh, online format as an interactive magazine that we have developed um, following these topics. And um, of course, these uh, two policy briefs. It was uh, very good that uh, the orientation was towards very concrete policy recommendations. Uh, that were uh, building on the previously conducted researches, but also on the very informative discussions that we had uh, during uh, different level groups uh, that um, we were hosting. And we were somehow integrating um, these in the, um, in the systems of, uh, of a further discussion. Um, the concerning the Uh, very topic. I think that uh, things uh, we were integrating in the um, interactive work of the two urban agenda partnerships. At the one hand, on the other hand, um, big scale ASPON research and the common suggestions that we have received in the process of drafting from the previous and um, what is um, very important, I think, for you to somehow try to position it is that uh, sometimes it is uh, very difficult to uh, anchor uh, the work done at such a high European level, at the national level, at the regional level and at the urban level. What uh, we did, we have initiated a very broad discussion with uh, many different levels of stakeholders in order to draft uh, two national programs. Um, it was in the preparation phase and in the in presidency phase. So, um, the Urban Green Infrastructure Development Program uh, was launched and uh, the Circular Management of Building and Spaces Development Program as well. It was, um, in a way, very good because um, we started to develop them uh, before as a preparation um, to our presidency, as a way to engage all levels of stakeholders and to make them aware of the processes going on. And at the same time, uh, we use them now actively for something that we didn't know it, it will come. It is a um, recovery and resilience facility and the recovery and resilience national plan. Uh, so um, we have seen uh, how it is possible to start from a very broad uh, topic, initiating the um, trans-European discussion and then really translating them in the very uh, concrete um, mid-term impact indicators that will um, inform components, uh, several components of our national plan. So uh, this interaction is, uh, is quite good. Um, what I saw in the Spanish uh, Recovery and Resilience National Plan is that you have a strong link um, in the first component with the uh, urban agenda and uh, I really welcome this. Uh, we are working on several national plans uh, and um, I only, in, only in, uh, in your plan I saw this uh, very um, explicit link and I think it is an um, excellent way to, to move forward, to think um, in this direction. I couldn't see, but I saw only a draft of the program explicit link with territorial agenda, but I believe it will be a transversal topic through all components. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, 
many thanks, Ivana, for uh, for uh, your presentation and in order to adjust uh, the, the, the the time uh, for your speech, I think uh, it was a very good picture regarding some uh, specific issue, thematic issues to be developed. Uh, green infrastructure, natural based solutions, circular economy, and in the end, uh, sustainable land use. Right now, uh, please, uh, Anna Seixas, uh, take the words and uh, explain the, the Portuguese uh, uh, pilot program. And Anna. Thank you very much, Joaquin. Thank you very much for the invitation, for being here, and to have the opportunity to share with you our pilot action for the territorial agenda 2013 and uh, i will try to share uh, uh i just like to start this presentation uh by showing you uh the just to just to make a brief remark uh regarding the the the, the title that we choose to our to our pilot action. Indeed, we choose uh, climate change adaptation and resilience through landscape transition. And here I would like to highlight the word landscape because we found out that this is a very wide word. When we are talking with uh, uh, planners, they know they have an idea about landscape. When we are talking about with politicians, they do, when we talk about people in general, everybody has a position and thinks what they think about landscape. So we, tr we thought that this could be a uh, wording could be important in this process. Um, just to give you a brief background on this, on this project, uh, this is a project that do not start from the scratch. Well, in 2017, when we had, uh, we were at that time doing the re reviewing our national um, special policy uh, planning policy program that we had one that was started in 2007. And then we reviewed it 10 years after in 2017. And the, in that time, uh, climate change was all, already a big issue. But it was interesting because when we, are, we, we, we were working in October 2017, we had uh, major wildfires. And in fact, in October, the climate in Portugal is quite mild. And uh, in, the in the middle of, of October, we had very, very high temperatures. It was a very different climate. And it, I think this inspired uh, us even most to, to tackle this issue in a different way. So uh, in our national program, uh, national special planning policy program, it's difficult to say it in English, uh, uh, we, we tackle this issue about climate change very seriously. And these images that I present you here, it's some of the, the work that we have done. So we have, uh, we try to find information about um, EU level. So to have here the, the framework to work with, but we have a lot of scenarios regarding climate change. So we found out that for instance, we, Portugal will be in the future affected by heat waves very seriously. And then we decided to have um, a, a chart that has the potential hazard for wildfire. And we found out that we have a lot of our territory will be, um, we have impacts regarding the wildfires. Fires. Also, we have projected the temperature and uh, also the precipitation. And you can see that uh, half of our country will be affected for this uh, climate change um, scenarios. So we try to build, uh, I don't know if I can move this, um, sorry. No, I cannot. Uh, so we try to, to build uh, a strategy um, that started, as I said, in the National Special Planning Policy Program, that it's a multi-sectoral program that informs all the regional and all the municipality uh, process of planning. Uh, and so we, we, we started from the, from the wildfires and we tried to, in, uh, to identify what should be the most vulnerable territories that we have. And so that's why we came to this approach uh, where we have uh, the, the, this is, um, it, it's the, the, the smallest, uh, um, 
administrative, uh, it's, we call it freguesias, it's even um, more detailed than the municipalities. And uh, we found out that we have all this territory who should be impacted by wildfires and we, we are going to have, we will have a problem with that. So we developed after our national special planning policy program in 2019, we developed this year a program that we call it uh, the landscape transformation, um, we call it, let me see just how to say it in English, like landscape transformation program. It's a program for all countries, but especially for these vulnerable territories that we, we need to make, we want to, to change. We want to improve our land use, uh, what land use we have in those territories by changing the landscape. So here in this, um, in this map, we can find all the vulnerable territories we have in the northern, the, the northern, central and northern part of Portugal, but as well here in the south. And in these in this, uh, territories, we have more than 40% of foresty land use. So it's a continuous of uh, forests, and especially with forests with uh, species that grow very fast, like eucalyptus species. And then uh, in, this, in, the, in this um, national landscape transformation, uh, transformation program, we decided that we need to have landscape programs. It's, it's, uh, it's a small scale. Uh, we have about 20 of them uh, all over the, the, the country. And the one that we choose to be our pilot, um, in territorial, pilot action in territorial agenda is here in the south that sits uh, here in the near Algarve. And it's a very interesting um, territory because it's near the, the coast where we have, uh, as you know, the Algarve beaches and all the tourism. And also we have here, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a mountain, a small one, but it's a mountain and we have, it's like a shrinking territory. So we here we try to merge the process regarding to impact climate change impact, but as well as shrinking rural areas um, in, this, uh, in this program. It has been approved in, to, in 2020, and it's from here that we start our pilot action. So see, this is the scenario that we found out in uh, Monchique. This is the, the pilot action it took take place in Monchique. And this is, was the scenario that we have with wildfires. It's quite um, scaring. Um, and we try to, we want to, to tackle this in a different way. So uh, just to summarize, uh, we have wildfires uh, and it's uh, something that occurs very uh, regularly. Uh, we have now political measures uh, like the, this national program and also the landscape transformation program. And so we have a multi-scale here and it's important to, to stress that um, when we were planning and we, are we were approving all these programs, we have this uh, connection with the national sectoral policies, but also with regional uh, and, and as well as local with the municipalities and stakeholders. So we try to build here a building of multi-level um, governance. So, uh, the pilot, uh, the pilot action, uh, it's now from our side, it's moving. Um, we, we, when, when I start my presentation, I talked about the landscape because not only it's a word that can have connections among everybody, but as well, because it's something that we need to think in the long term. Uh, governance needs a long-term procedure, but uh, the, the landscape transformation needs it as well. So we, we think here in a, in a way that we call it in a slow planning. We can make the transformation, we can change the land use, we can change the forest, we can do everything, but then we need to maintain and we need to, to be sure that it goes for a long period, that in our program it's planned like 20 years. It's a lot. So it's a long-term commitment at all levels of governance. Uh, and we, we are trying to base it in better regulations and implementation plans. So we have a multi-scale um, process approaching, like Zooming. Um, we, we know it and we would like to, to highlight 
how we think that it's re uh, linked to the territorial agenda. So we have the, uh, the prior priorities of the territorial agenda, just Europe and green Europe, but also uh, with the, the objectives that we have already heard this morning, early this morning, like functional re uh, regions and early healthy environments. So we are trying to connect it with the territorial agenda like this, but also, as you know, uh, it's a new uh, EU initiative that is emerging uh, with a long-term vision for rural areas. And we would like to, during our presidency, with ESPEN support, to have this connection also with the long-term vision for territorial areas. So these are the, the focus, the, the main thematic uh, priorities um, of our pilot action. Uh, it's like climate change adaptation and territorial resi resilience, ecosystem services, and the green economy, endogenous resources and natural capital. Natural capital is something that we stress really uh, as really important in, a, in our national program and also the governments and stakeholders engagement. Just to detail a little bit uh, this, uh, these objectives, when we're talking about integrating, uh, we are talking about uh, thinking about that territories need to be better prepared for risks just wildfire, this is our main issue is wildfire, but I think this is a wide concept, not only with wildfires, but also with loss of biodiversity and reduction in agricultural productivity become higher and more costly. So we are trying here to connect all sectors like the conservation sector and also the agriculture sector. Uh, the other objective like fostering ecosystem services and the green economy, we think this is a major issue in our pilot because uh, uh, when we're talking about ecosystem services here we can we, we can have this long-term vision vision if we can implement for instance the um, the long uh, the ecosystem service payment uh, in uh, with the, the land owners and the, the, the stakeholders we think we can have here um, a framework to to have this vision uh, for 20, 20 years. So this is uh, really important in our pilots. Also, we'd like to mobilize indigenous resources uh, and capital, natural capital valorization. In Portugal, we define like natural capital, the resource of the natural resources that are linked with water, with soil, with biodiversity, and also with forests. So we think that uh, this notion that uh, we, if we have natural capital in our territories, we can improve uh, its performance and we can protect and people need to be appropriate with this natu natural capital. They need to understand that if they have water in their territory, it's important. Because sometimes, as you know, you know, we have territories that are some constraints about land use because they have water that is drinkable in other territories. For instance, we have in the central of Portugal, uh, some reservoirs and people that live um, around those reservoirs have some, some uh, constraints about using their land because they need to protect the water that is going to be drink in Lisbon. So this is the natural capital is something that we find that it's uh, something that we need to, to be very, to stress on. Uh, and also building innovative process of governance. Uh, uh, landscape transformation, I think it will be transition take time uh, and we need to build and consolidate a lot of, of, of governance pro uh, process. Um, we have also the connection with this, uh, with this pilot action as well as ESPON. We, uh, we are now working in this, in this, pro this project that is Territorial Impacts of Natural Disasters, Titan. Uh, and it's, it has been very important, this connection, because we have some support, technical support from, from them. So just, uh, just to summarize, uh, it is a lot of bullets and a lot of, uh, it's not easy because we know when we are talking about um, uh, European level processes, some uh, things get a little bit complicated, but here I try just to, to summarize um, what our, how do you see, how do we see our, these pilot actions? And so uh, we have here uh, the nation, this is our pilot action. We have here our national 
uh, framework, the National Special Planning Policy Program that informs also the landscape transformation program that gives the support uh, in our legislation and in our planning process. process, process. Uh, uh, this is the planning, the, the landscape planning and management program of Serra de Monchique Isidro, that is the, the zoom that we have made to, to this territory, but also we have the national funding. And the, on the other hand, we have here all the EU um, framework and we try to connect it. For instance, we have think about how can we, we think this pilot actually, uh, it's like a living lab. So we, as we are speaking, we are now implementing the process. So we would like really much to have uh, the information for our, from other countries, uh, experience that they have, if we can share the experience on those main objectives that I have uh, spoken uh, before, it should be really important. It's not to have, a, um, uh, we'd like to, to do, to experiment if uh, experience that could be, that have been implemented in our countries, in other countries, with our, with other perspectives can be used here. It's like a living lab. It's like something that is happening and we will try to connect all the information. We have in our European recovery plan, uh, our national proposal, we have submitted this, um, this uh, landscape transformation program as a process for changing the way we intervene in rural and uh, areas. Uh, and so we think that we can have here a support to tackle all this, uh, this all this process and especially uh, get information from what we will be learning with our uh, pilot action. So uh, next steps, uh, we are now preparing everything, uh, the implementation phase that we have already started uh, um, in Portugal, but we now we want to to try to to planning for, for as a, as a uh, pilot action from the territorial agenda. Um, we have, we would like to have EU partners. Now we have already some, we have meeting, we had meetings with Croatia and with Greece. I think they are, they could be interested and I think they are interested, but it's not, we, and, and we think that Spain would be a major partner in this process, but we have not found, found out yet who could be uh, the, 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 our partner in this process. So. Uh, I give I leave here the invitation for that, and now we have already in Portugal uh, as I tried to explain to you. This is a multi-level process and governance, and we have now more than ten um, stakeholders involved. Uh, I I was trying to to think more than it's, it's about uh, twenty, but uh, some of them it's not really confirmed. So I'll take the the less value. I take ten but it's already um, going on. Um, I think the main object, the, 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 um, the, the things that could be really important for us to, to, to work together at EU level could be like, uh, for instance, climate finance. Uh, I think that uh, if we try to connect this transform long-term trans transformation with funding in EU, sometimes we have funds are related to the cycle of funding, but uh, sometimes uh, poly sectoral policies do not think together. So we can have financing for forestry. And if the same person applies for agriculture in the same territory, sometimes you cannot get it financed because we can be sure that they don't have double financing, but also they can be asking, applying for different procedures uh, and here transforming the landscape, we need to have more interfaces, we need to change uh, forestry to agriculture. And so we need to think this in a wider perspective. Um, so we like to have innovative solutions uh, in, in a joint research uh, for innovative, innovative solutions. And so uh, we'd like to, to have uh, other countries to join us uh, in this process. So this is what we had. Uh, that's what moved us to this process, to, to, to this pilot uh, action. And this is what we have in some parts of the same mountain in Algarve, and it's like heaven. Uh, and so we would like to achieve it 
uh, in a very um, um, we uh, another thing that I forgot to to tell you about it's because in all this process we are always looking for a new economy for the territory so it could be more pro productive uh, more sustainable uh, and so that's what we we aim for thank you very much and so sorry if I pass the time surgido diferentes eh, diferentes cuestiones no yo creo que eh, hemos has introducido un elemento nuevo no que es el tema del paisaje no que viene a guiar un poco es, es la, la, el tutor ¿no? de, de, de la actuación que, que estáis proponiendo se unen a los, a los que Iván había planteado pero también recuperáis después me ha gustado creo que es muy interesante eh, ese esfuerzo de coordinación ¿no? que mostrabas en, en, en una de las diapositivas de ver cómo los diferentes las diferentes iniciativas ¿no? que hay en marcha a los diferentes niveles, cómo hacer un esfuerzo por darle una coherencia ¿no? y después proponer una actuación que tenga esa, digamos, esa potencia ¿no? de acuerdo con, con esto que inicialmente pues, mezcla eh, paisaje, mezcla cambio climático y sus efectos y todo ello lo lleva pues, a la planificación territorial como como bueno, eh, digamos, eh, ocurra, ocurría con, con Ivana y que también es el motivo de, de este seminario. ¿no? Entiendo que bueno, hay una serie de cuestiones que ya han planteado algunos compañeros de, del chat ¿no? sobre cómo procurar incluso alguna coordinación sobre otras eh, políticas ¿no? europeas y sobre todo yo creo que me quedaría con un mensaje y es el hecho de la invitación a que este tipo de propuestas y de acciones piloto pudieran contar con un socio español. ¿no? Es decir, que realmente tuviéramos la oportunidad y, esta, y este foro, digamos, fuera la oportunidad para que alguna persona responsable de alguna administración local o regional ¿no? que estaban inscritas en el seminario, pues eh, pudieran eh, tomar la decisión de incorporarse ¿no? como un caso de estudio, establecer, digamos, eh, alianzas para caminar en esta, en esta dirección que vosotros proponéis respecto del, del paisaje en un sentido digamos que muy amplio ¿no? y que se ligaría un poco con esta idea del soft planning que has introducido y de la, y de la gobernanza, ¿no? lo cual pues es una forma, eh, bueno, tal vez no muy regulativa ¿no? de los usos del suelo que tenemos eh, la costumbre en, en algunos países como los nuestros, pero que conviene ir completando y avanzando. Retomaremos esta cuestión o estas cuestiones un poco más adelante cuando escuchemos al, al último de nuestros eh, ponentes como se dice muy habitualmente, aquello de last but not least, en absoluto en este caso, ¿no? como es eh, Daniel, Daniel Metzial del BBRS ¿no? de, 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 de Alemania, que nos va a explicar un poco el, el sentido ¿no? de, 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 la, de la acción piloto y de toda la iniciativa hacia una renovación de esta Agenda Territorial Europea dos, 2030, que nos, que nos tendrá que comprometer para dar sentido a todas estas actuaciones que estamos eh, apuntando, estamos eh, planteando en la primera mesa y también en la segunda. Así que, Daniel, cuando quieras, bienvenido, muchas gracias. La palabra es tuya. Thank you, dear colleagues. Um, can you hear me? Do you understand me? Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you for the possibility to, to present uh, the Territorial Agenda 2030 and especially the uh, German pilot action. Uh, let me just recall, in 2015, the ministers de to de decided to start the renewal process on the territorial agenda. And in 2018, this process was actively uh, decided on by the director generals. And back then already, um, um, from the beginning, it was emphasized that the focus of the new territorial agenda should be on its implementation. Next slide, please. I will shortly refer to, to three points. The first one is how is the territorial agenda addressing key players and what are pilot actions? The second is which pilot actions uh, are planned because there are six pilot actions in the pipeline. And then uh, shortly, what is the German pilot action about? 
So how is the territorial agenda addressing key players? In, uh, it has an own chapter four where it addresses key stakeholders. It addresses especially member states on three levels. First on the intergovernmental level, then on the national level, and then also on the sub-national levels. Also, uh, different EU institutions that are key for the implementation and application of the territorial agenda priorities are addressed, such as the Commission, the European Parliament, as co-legislators, the Committee of Regions, the ESC, the European Investment Bank, as, as someone who can support financing, but also the European associations addressing special developments. Every player is in the uh, territorial agenda asked to take actions for the implementation uh, in its competency and in its regular mandate. So action can be taken at any administrative level from local to pan-European and it can vary in character and focus. We decided for that to have a low threshold and we decided against a rigid action program because um, we were confident that by, doing, by having a low threshold, it would be easier for others to start with pilot actions. These pilot actions can show new solutions or they can showcase existing. Next slide, please. So as you can see, they are flexible in focus and character. They can explore or showcase. The bottom line is that they first support a place-sensitive policy making, Secondly, that they strengthen the territorial dimension. And thirdly, that they address one of the six priorities, I guess, in the beginning of the day, uh, were mentioned by uh, Dr. Kai Böhme. Next slide, please. So which six pilot actions are actually planned to implement the uh, Territorial Agenda 2030. Um, Anna already spoke about the climate change adaption and resilience through landscape transition, which you can see at the bottom. Um, I will uh, speak shortly about the uh, other uh, pilot actions. So we have uh, the understanding how sector policies shape spatial imbalances. That is a pilot action uh, proposed by uh, Poland. And it uh, aims on looking how sector policies affect the territories and uh, speak about a territorial impact assessment and make uh, probably uh, proposals how to merge different, um, different ways uh, that are now being taken by, let's say, for the, the um, Committee of the Regions and uh, other member states on, um, on these territorial impact assessments. The second one is small places matter for territorial development. This is a Norwegian uh, pilot action, and it looks especially on the role of small places and how their role can be boosted. And a third aspect of this uh, pilot action is about actually shrinking cities um, on how this shrinking can be caught. The third uh, pilot action I would like to mention is a territorial vision for a cross-border functional region that is a pilot action by Luxembourg. Um, it aims for a vision for the year 2050 for a decarbonized and resilient uh, cross-border functional region. So it has a, a much wider territorial view and um, yeah, they want to develop a joint territorial vision and translate this uh, vision into concrete objectives and strategies and measures. And then uh, fourth pilot actions about Alpine towns for citizens that is uh, from, the, from Switzerland. Uh, it connects with the Swiss presidency for the Alpine convention that starts next year. And it has two aspects. One aspect is how to involve civil society more carefully in in uh, spatial planning processes and uh, thematically uh, it addresses climate adaption. So how can we uh, involve civil society more in uh, uh, planning processes that relate to climate actions? Uh, as you can see from this short overview until I come now to the German pilot actions, we have uh, a broad spatial and thematical coverage here um, and this illustrates also the diversity of 
possible applications of the territorial agenda. We address different types of territories. We have cities, we have small towns, we have rural and remote areas, and we also have a functional cross-border uh, region here. So what is Germany actually addressing? So Europe's regions are territorial diverse. Uh, they are diverse in terms of development conditions and the potentials. And one core political priority of the Federal Ministry of the Interior for Building and Community here in Germany is to strive for more equivalent living conditions in all regions in Germany. And this is, means also um, that uh, cross-borderly, we aim for a more balanced Europe. And that, is, that was the, um, the first thing we thought about when we developed uh, our own pilot action. And this aims to secure services of general interest and strengthen integrated uh, regional development. We want to uh, aim to, to strengthen economic, social and cultural anchor points in structural weak regions in order to maintain and increase the quality of life outside urban areas and nearby hubs for everyday services in sparsely populated areas play a decisive role for the economic development and social well-being at region level. Next slide, please. So the pilot action shall accompany the implementation of measures uh, of strategic relevance to secure services of general interest on local level, for example, in the areas of supply and digitalization. And we will have six participating uh, pilot regions. Three will be from Germany, from different parts of Germany. And then we will have three uh, European regions uh, that are joining us. One uh, is from Portugal, Alenteo. Um, a second one is from Austria, and a third one is from France. So we get a, a broader view, a European view, and this will um, strengthen also uh, two more aspects. Firstly, the transfer and the upscaling. So as we have a broad European view here, we um, will have results and findings on the local level that we can transfer uh, to policy plans and programs, on, not only on the national, but also on the European level. And we also want to raise uh, as a final aim, uh, the awareness and concerns of lagging regions in all of Europe uh, at national, but also on European level. So we want to uh, have uh, best practices find out in these pilot actions that can be upscaled and transferred to other regions in Europe and then can, that can be brought to the attention uh, of political leaders. Um, next slide, please. So with that short introduction, I would come to an end. And if you want to inform yourself more, uh, more specifically about the territorial agenda process and the actions that are planned, then uh, please use this website, www.territorialagenda.eu. There are all um, uh, documents included, and we update it regularly uh, also on, these, on the actions that are planned. There is, will be a, uh, there is a blog uh, function on that uh, website where member states are invited to um, write about their uh, experiences in applying the territorial agenda in their national context. Context. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, <clears throat> Daniel. Thanks for for uh, for your uh, presentation. Unas presentaciones decía. Bastante sustanciosas ¿no? en cuanto a, a, a lo que demuestra cómo poder ir avanzando hacia lo que sería una eh, consideración territorial de las diferentes iniciativas políticas y en el caso de, de, de lo que sería el, el, la acción piloto ¿no? que nos ha presentado Daniel para el caso alemán una ejemplificación de una de las funciones que tiene la ordenación del territorio que es la reducción 
en la medida de lo posible de las desigualdades territoriales. ¿no? Creo que ha comentado algunas cuestiones que me gustaría resaltar. Y es que se plantea esta iniciativa de la agenda territorial desde un punto de vista, eh, por un lado, firme, es decir, el compromiso ¿no? para poder llevarlo a cabo entre los diferentes actores, instituciones implicadas a los diferentes niveles. Y él eh, citaba desde la dimensión intergubernamental ¿no? a nivel de los estados y de las diferentes regiones y entidades locales, pero también con las diferentes eh, instituciones ¿no? eh, europeas, a nivel eh, de, europeo y de la Comisión, que es un elemento también importante a tener en cuenta en el motivo ¿no? de, de la cohesión territorial. Pero por otra parte, creo que apuntaba una cuestión interesante como era el tema de la flexibilidad, ¿no? en tanto que eh, se tocan diferentes temas y se tocaban diferentes eh, territorios. Desde, desde ese punto de vista, pues sería un poco eh, el hecho de querer mantener el, el, la gran guía, ¿no? el gran tutor, el, el main goal ¿no? o, el, o el mainstream, pero que eh, cada uno encontrara ¿no? ese local based approach ¿no? eh, que venimos trabajando ya desde finales de la década de los 2000, allá por el año 2009 con el informe Barca, de realmente tratar de buscar el propio carácter territorial para eh, promover esas estrategias de desarrollo territorial que nos lleven a esa pretendida cohesión e igualdad ¿no? entre los diferentes territorios. Han aparecido algunas eh, cuestiones ¿no? que yo eh, voy a trasladar a los eh, ponentes, fundamentalmente por parte de algunos de los asistentes y a partir de la intervención especialmente de Ana eh, con el tema del paisaje, eh, planteaban la cuestión de, y es una pregunta que puede eh, hacerse extensiva a todos los ponentes, eh, cómo el, el, el paisaje o, la, o el territorio a veces ¿no? en las áreas rurales o en las áreas deprimidas eh, suelen estar muy en contacto con las áreas, digamos, de carácter más rural. ¿no? Entonces, la pregunta que se hacía eh, por parte de eh, Julio Plaza era... Eh, ¿Cómo poder unir o si se ha considerado alguna opción de poder unir también lo que sería la agenda territorial con otras políticas europeas como la política agrícola comunitaria? ¿no? Esta era una cuestión que yo creo que habla de la necesidad de probablemente de coordinación ¿no? y en algún momento se discutió la necesidad incluso dentro de la propia comisión de poder eh, considerar este principio, objetivo ¿no? y política de cohesión territorial como un elemento transversal que pudiera coordinar el funcionamiento de las políticas sectoriales. No sé esto como, como lo veis, ¿no? que sería mi, pre, mi primera pregunta. ¿no? Entiendo que el elemento de la coordinación, que si no recuerdo mal, eh, la coordinación de las políticas sectoriales ¿no? es uno de los elementos también eh, preferentes de, de la acción piloto de, de Alemania. Eh, ¿Cómo podría eh, poder avanzarse o cómo creéis ¿no? que se puede ir consiguiendo para tratar de dar esa pretendida la coherencia a las acciones que, que proponéis. Puedes empezar tú si quieres, Ana. Gracias, Joaquín, y gracias por la, por la pregunta. Pasará en inglés. Uh, well, uh, I thank you very much for the question. Yes, it's, uh, it's really it's a challenge that we feel here. In Portugal, uh, we try to connect all the sectors, and uh, as we it is expected, they have a, a different, a different point. They have different points of views. Um, regarding the, um, we, we had a, a very interesting experience during our national plan, uh, policy program because we have a, a commission that uh, follows followed all the process uh, of building the, pro the program. And we try to, you need, we need make some connections between territorial uh, planning and sectoral policies. And it was very interesting for us to discuss with agriculture and with the funding of agriculture, the agricultural funding, uh, what was the process that they follow and how the agricultural policy, EU policy impacts Uh, territorial transformation. In fact, if we stay just very still, only by funding the agriculture, we could have a, a transformation of the territory. If we don't have these connections, uh, sometimes we, we, have, we have discussed that only the, the PAC, the, the agricultural policy for 
from the European Union can make uh, can make landscape land use planning. Um, so because the funds all, always uh, have the, this dimension of transforming uh, the territory. So yes, uh, we we are aware of the, the need for this connection and for this uh, the process being uh, built together, and we are trying to have a very um, active role in Portugal uh, with our authorities, national authorities that are now planning and and have the, the responsibilities at EU level level regarding the the agriculture policy. Uh, we don't know what we are going to achieve. I don't think that, uh, I don't know. I hope that we can have some results, especially if it's not very, it, it has two uh, main issues. One is when, if we can connect the funding, as I told you, sometimes the fundings are separate, forests are separate from agriculture, from um, cohesion, uh, different authorities make different projects. Uh, sometimes the, the, the objectives that they are even are similar and we are trying at national level to have this, um, this overview and, and try to, to make possible if we have some funding for agriculture in, even in the same territory, forestry can have as well, if they are connected and if they show that are linked and they they contribute to the to the to the sustainable development of the territory. Uh, I, I know that it's not easy, but it's one of our major major concerns. The other one it's uh, really to consider the impacts of the of the lack of resources with soil, for instance. Uh, we are trying to to have the idea that we need to. To, um, we have problems with soil erosion, but also with desertification, and all these uh, concepts uh, are now getting uh, more important in the planning of uh, agriculture funding and how we are going to to have the um, how the, the funding will get to the to the to, to the stakeholders and the, the companies that work, for instance, in agriculture. Um, Yes, that's what we are trying to do. And this, this uh, landscape transformation pro uh, program also works with the funds at national level, uh, where we try to, to match the national funding with the EU funding uh, for have uh, a more comprehensive and a more wide way to, to, um, to stakeholders uh, to, to get funding to, to to move forward because I sometimes uh, uh, it's not easy for everybody that has a small property uh, can access to, to to funds. So it's a lot of uh, uh, different levels of uh, in, that we are trying to intervene with uh, with uh, in Portugal with our national level. Pueden hacer eh, alguna, pueden contestar en el caso de Iván o Daniel la forma en que se puede procurar esa eh, coordinación ¿no? entre las diferentes eh, políticas sectoriales en la dirección de, de los temas que apuntan. Soleil, eh... Ivana, will you start or shall I? Uh, well, Daniel, uh, if you don't mind, please uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Uh, Empieza, Daniel, por favor. I'm, I'm sorry um, that I look. Uh, I, I haven't done my translation here, so I followed in, in Spanish, and my Spanish is not good enough to, to grasp all, but if you ask about and when I see what Anna said about coordination between different uh, ministries, well, for sure, that is, um, that is also uh, an issue here. Um, I can say um, that we are in, in, that we had, uh, that we were in contact with all the other ministries when, uh, when developing the, uh, the territorial agenda and also the pilot actions. 
uh, and there are for certain different views on, uh, on, on, on how to proceed. Um, it was mentioned shortly, um, the Commission started the process on the long-term rule vision, and uh, I think until the end of the month, uh, you can uh, also make an input uh, on this public uh, consultation that the Commission started. And um, for sure, for example, uh, we, uh, we want to include the territorial agenda in this uh, process on, on a long-term vision for rural areas. Uh, we have contacts with uh, DG Agri from the Commission who wants that as well and also ask us uh, to inform them about the pilot action we do on the, on the territorial agenda because they plan something similar for their uh, rural vision. And we also um, have uh, German presidency conclusions uh, that we will um, uh, adopt uh, on Tuesday actually, next, next week in the presidential meeting. And one of the issues there is uh, that we ask all forthcoming presidencies to have uh, joint meetings of director general from spatial planning and territorial cohesion on the one side and from sector policies on the other side. Because we have seen that under the Finnish presidency, where we had a joint meeting between uh, territorial cohesion uh, DGs and DGs from uh, cohesion policy, and it was very fruitful to, to have this cross sectoral. Uh, discussions and to, to share to share views and we aim to to have that on a regular basis in the future but um, uh, yeah that also it, it depends on both sides not not only from our side but also um, to uh, to get the territorial dimension thinking more closely to the sector policies thank you um. Thank you. Um, I am also apologizing because I have some tech translation is not really uh, working for me. So uh, as uh, Daniel did, I will try to understand from Spanish <laughs> what the question was about. But uh, anyhow, um, what um, I would like to point out is this uh, big opportunity that we have in such a brief period of time to translate uh, basically the principles negotiated so hard uh, through territorial um, uh, simply to try to translate them in the national programs for recovery and resilience. And I think um, this is quite important because we have this uh, huge opportunity to act really swiftly. Uh, deadlines are um, really there and most countries have submitted um, their first draft. And uh, here we are working with very good and strong um, mid-term indicators, mid-term impact indicators, and we can connect it uh, towards the reforms. So there is a possibility uh, to uh, translate the ideas that uh, we have commonly agreed upon and drafted very swiftly, very uh, effectively into the uh, national systems. And this is something that we are currently working on, not only in Croatia, but also in, uh, in some other countries. So I think um, it is a really, really important point. Another thing that Daniel mentioned is this um, cross-thematic uh, meetings. I, also, I was also participating at the meeting uh, organized um, with John Bachler during the Finnish presidency of the Territorial Cohesion and Cohesion Policy, and it was very, very fruitful. Uh, we really, um, I think it's uh, it's so good uh, way to move forward, and congratulations also to Germany to um, take over the same, uh, the same approach. I think that um, if we are uh, going to make it more like um, uh, leaving the um, structured um, uh, towers that we have built within a specific sectorial team, um, we are benefiting so much more uh, in, um, in the team itself. And uh, this is really a challenging time and a great opportunity at, uh, at the same point to um, rethink, to do it really um, more uh, punctual and faster. And I really see it as a, as a period of opportunities and it is a good moment to launch uh, such an important uh, strategic document when we really need a long-term strategic thinking on uh, how to move on. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Ivana. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, better I can uh, formulate my, my questions directly in order to be uh, better understood in the, the sense of, the, of the, my questions. Uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, this issue of the coordination of, of sectoral uh, views in, 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 in spatial planning is one of the most problematic issues in, in Mediterranean countries, for instance, for, for planning. And, uh, and really, I think it's uh, really necessary to make an effort uh, in order to try to promote uh, this kind of coherence, uh, maybe uh, ex ante and ex post with territorial impact assessment, but also with this kind of, of uh, coordination of actions. Yeah? And um, in this sense, I think, uh, well, the, the, the question is, uh, um, for us, from a South Mediterranean point of view, a Spanish point of view, probably it's very difficult uh, to, to find the, the philosophical uh, stone in order to make possible this kind of uh, under common understanding from all, all administrations in order to uh, be forward in, in such direction of, such direction of uh, territorial agenda. And uh, I would like to, to, to wonder and to ask to, to, to all of you uh, which kind of uh, routines or uh, which kind of procedures could be used in order to uh, uh, find alliances, commitment uh, from the national ministry, for instance, in your case, uh, what, what is, the, what is the, the way in which you could find this institutional support in order to lead this kind of process? Yeah? So which kind of factors could be interesting in order to, to, to achieve this, uh, this alliance, uh, this commitment from political side? And uh, afterwards, the question is, uh, Probably, if uh, the second question, if uh, we are working at the national uh, level, uh, how we can share all these kind of uh, best practices, best thinkings, best intentions um, among or between different uh, member states. So probably uh, interact, uh, uh, urbact, and such uh, some other initiatives could be could be uh, interesting. Uh, um, actions previously developed, but the, the big issue is uh, at this moment how this uh, territorial agenda could be shared in a very broader way with all people that could be interested from an European point of view, is such uh, 28 uh, countries uh, altogether. These two questions we'd we'll, we'll like to, to ask to, to, to all of you. So, Probably I, I start with a few words. Um, uh, I think communication is uh, is key, and um, the renewal process now comes to an end uh, on Tuesday when we adopt the territorial agenda. But the implementation and communication of the territorial agenda is even more decisive and starts, and it's more challenging even. And about communication, and as we see right now, also languages. That is, 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 um, uh, is, is an important point. So uh, one aspect is we will translate the territorial agenda in the next year. The Commission has has uh, will fund that into all languages. So the territorial agenda will be um, uh, translated uh, in in all EU official languages. That's the first point. Then what we did is uh, we made a summary. A short summary of, uh, of, of uh, grasping what the territorial agenda is about on four pages. And this will also be translated in all languages. So um, to reach out to the political level, because the territorial agenda now is about, I don't know, it's 80 paragraphs and it's 20 to 30 pages, depending on the language. So for, for a minister, he won't read that, but he could read a short summary on four pages that comes to the point. Um, then we plan an atlas, or we have it, an atlas for the territorial agenda, where we present in maps, visualizing the challenges and priorities of uh, spatial development in Europe. And we have good experiences uh, made with that, with the Espon Atlas in 2014, and we have done that now for the territorial agenda, and this atlas will be published next Tuesday, uh, first in German and English, but uh, Espon has decided to translate this atlas also 
in all languages of the European Union. So the Atlas will also be available in Spanish. And I think this is a major thing for reaching out to the local and regional level where language competencies probably are not uh, as evolved. Um, another thing is that we tried to institutionalize the uh, application and implementation of the territorial agenda. So the task force that is now uh, working on the renewal process um, will uh, transform into a territorial agenda working group from 2021 on onwards. And they will meet two times under each presidency and they have especially, especially the uh, task to monitor the, uh, the application of and implementation of the territorial agenda. Um, so this is uh, one thing that the implementation gets, uh, let's say, institutionalized and uh, more long lasting. Um, another aspect is uh, when we speak about uh, visualization and we speak about data, then we have to speak about ESPON and ESPON support. And ESPON uh, is now currently drafting their new program for the next period, 2021 to 2027. And they aim to have a special cross-sectoral activity advice and support to the Territorial Agenda 2030 and to include measures in all thematic action plans that they are doing. And this is a second institutionalizing uh, aspect that could help um, to support the implementation process and to reach out to political leaders, because that is what ESPON aims for, to, to make from a scientific approach data available and transform that into advices for the political level. So this would be my answer. Um, okay. Yes, Ivana, please. Ah, thank you. Well, um, I would like uh, to thank Daniel for this very uh, broad answer because I think it is important uh, for all of you who are not into technical details of uh, process of drafting territorial agenda really to understand what are the negotiated steps. Um, from uh, my point of view, what is really interesting is this change of approach from the implementation process of urban agenda, uh, how it was designed because we participated in many partnerships of urban agenda and we saw all positive sides and also all shortcomings. And um, the change of approach that Daniel and his colleagues and um, Kai also uh, have um, designed for the territorial agenda. So basically this idea of a pilot project it is something which is different from the action plans of the Urban Agenda Partnerships, which were very structured and uh, predefined process in which all partnerships should jump in following the similar structure. And sometimes it uh, resembled uh, the classical European project, but without budget and without uh, clear um, scope. It was um, so. Uh, sometimes uh, in some partnership uh, partnerships, it gave extraordinarily good results, and then in some partnerships, it really uh, spent lots of energy in a very broad circles. And um, I think that this idea of uh, pilot projects as a way to promote, to implement, and to uh, give a food for thoughts of the territorial agenda, the topics and issues, is a very good model. Uh, Croatia is part of um, the one, of one um, pilot. They are in communication with our Portuguese colleagues, and um, probably we will deal with uh, coastal systems and the issues related uh, with this climate change, landscape, cultural heritage. But I think um, what is really important is that um, we are trying to keep uh, the pilots of territorial agenda creative and alive. Uh, not trying to structure them in a too defined way, but really trying to uh, use them as an inspirational way of uh, moving forward and uh, giving the specific boosts of energy to specific uh, to uh, nation states and then further down to the, the regional and urban level. So um, this is, uh, I hope, uh, Chimo, this is a good uh, answer to your question, but I think um, it is important to highlight this uh, very subtle difference 
and the, the I think it will give a different uh, change of energy towards the territorial agenda. So it is important to be the part of pilot, and um, it is important really uh, to try to um, promote it on all levels of uh, governance within a nation state. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, Anna, please. Yes, I think I think Daniel and Ivana said it all. Uh, I just would like to stress that uh, I think after these two presidencies, uh, we now share a collective vision for the new territorial agenda, in fact. And I think Daniel and his team in during the presidency has done an excellent work. Uh, and I just have to say uh, that uh, during our presidency, we are really committed to make sure that the territorial agenda moves forward, not only in the next six months, but for uh, the long run. Uh, and so the two aspects that Daniel just mentioned regarding the implementation of pallet actions and also the communication process with ESPON uh, and with all the EU countries, I think we will be very committed in doing, in make sure that this works uh, and does not um, stops the, 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 this, uh, this way of thinking and of building the territorial agenda should continue, should need to continue in the, in the long term. And I think they said it all. So I don't know if you want anything more from my side, please. Uh, just one thing, uh, at national level, uh, just to say regarding the sectoral policies, uh, we build like a forum, a national forum. Uh, it's not a formal forum. It's something, it's, it's a place uh, where we, we talk about the things that are most complicated uh, in a very um, distressed way. Uh, and where we try to get some uh, uh, con um, contact points and also to not contact points, some, um, merge some, uh, some concerns and take some solutions after that. Uh, and uh, that's why we are trying to, to build on the, the, the interrelation between sectoral policies. Just, it's just starting, so I don't have a lot of information to give you. Uh, it, it, um, it was built and it was conceived after, after our national program policy um, program from uh, uh, land, uh, land use. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Anna. Many thanks to, to all of you. Uh, we are uh, at this moment in time. We have uh, some um, some additional question pending, but uh, um, I'll, I'll I'll try to uh, to manage this uh, afterwards. But uh, all these sessions will be uh, uh, uploaded in the web page of uh, Cátedra on the Cultura Territorial Valenciana and Fundicot, and uh, could be available available are by label for for all people um, and uh, at this moment uh, well I, I i would like to to th give thanks to all of you for for these uh, interesting uh, presentations i think we are uh, we are in the in the in the road uh, for sure we are starting a new process um, the challenge are important and uh, um, probably the most important thing uh, on my view is uh, how uh, these uh, these ideas, these uh, these proposals, could be progressively implemented and included in the political agenda of um, several countries in order to merge uh, the, the, the traditional way to act and to produce policies, programs, and actions with this kind of. Uh, uh, big uh, umbrella, big mainstreaming that could be, could uh, could help uh, in order to make um, these uh, actions very fruitful in order to provide a better quality of life and sustainable uh, land use for 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 the future. So uh, many thanks to all of you. And uh, at this moment, as uh, was envisaged, that uh, ten at uh, twelve o'clock, uh, we pros will proceed with the. Uh, ending of the seminar with the intervention of the our uh, secret autonomic secretariat of special planning in the regional government uh, immaculada uh, orozco 
So many thanks and uh, keep you posted about uh, all uh, all uh, news from this webinar. I share the we share the link uh, for all of you and uh, see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Sí, pues para finalizar el, eh, la jornada de hoy eh, invitamos a, a que tome la palabra Inmaculada Orozco Ripoy, secretaria autonómica de la Consellería de Política Territorial, Obras Públicas y Movilidad, para clausurar el, el webinar. Inmaculada, cuando quieras, por favor. Sí, buen día, buenos días. Espero que se me oiga porque yo sí, sí. os oía desde, sí, sí, bastante, sí. desde bastante lejos, gracias, la verdad. Gracias. Eh, first of all, thanks to Joaquín Farinos, Fundicot President and Director of the Valencian Territorial Culture Chair, for bringing us so much knowledge uh, around Territorial Agenda 2030. <laughs> Como digo, nuestro gobierno autonómico ha sido pionero dentro del Estado español al implementar muchas de estas políticas que tienen origen dentro de la Unión Europea y que han servido para paliar conductas muy agresivas con el territorio y el medio ambiente en tiempos desgraciadamente no tan lejanos. La Agenda Territorial Europea 2030 seguirá profundizando en la idea que la dimensión territorial tiene que estar presente transversalmente en todas las políticas sectoriales para conseguir una mayor cohesión económica y social, atendiendo a la diversidad para corregir los desequilibrios. Por ello, la manera en que aterrizamos a nuestra escala las determinaciones de la Unión Europea es fundamental para garantizar un escenario de igualdad tanto en los, entre los Estados miembros como entre las regiones que los conforman. Uno de los elementos que más contribuyen eh, de manera efectiva a fomentar esa cohesión económica y social es garantizar una ordenación del territorio basada en un modelo territorial policéntrico y, como decía, equitativo. Así, en la Comunidad Valenciana hemos sido pioneros en la introducción de la protección del paisaje y en la integración de la variable territorial en el desarrollo sostenible para cualquier otra política. También hemos asumido como propios los diversos documentos elaborados en la Unión Europea en materia territorial, la Estrategia Territorial Europea, el Libro Verde sobre la Cohesión Territorial, la Estrategia Europea 2020, la Agenda Territorial, etc. En estos momentos de profunda crisis en que se han evidenciado las debilidades de la globalización, es fundamental que el modelo económico resiliente por el cual hay que apostar decididamente encuentre su correspondencia en el modelo territorial. La proximidad de bienes y servicios se ha demostrado un elemento clave para afrontar situaciones como la que estamos viviendo, de forma que el peso de las ciudades medianas y de la franja intermedia para la implantación de actividades económicas es fundamental para asegurar el equilibrio territorial haciendo de bisagra entre el sistema rural y la franja litoral. Los planes de acción territorial que el Gobierno valenciano está impulsando están justamente encaminados a conseguir, entre otros, este objetivo y se encuentran, por tanto, totalmente alineados con los ejes para la reconstrucción que la Unión Europea plantea. Los planes de acción territorial de la infraestructura verde del litoral y de la Horta, ya aprobados en la anterior legislatura, son muestra de ese compromiso que se vehicula a través de la protección de nuestro patrimonio natural y cultural, también ante riesgos naturales e inducidos. En este momento y en sintonía con las propuestas de la Agenda Territorial 2020, continuamos desplegando planes de acción territorial que preparan nuestro territorio para los retos de presente y futuro el patch de Castelló, el Plan de Acción Territorial del Área Metropolitana de Valencia, el de Alicante Elche, el de las Comarcas Centrales y el de la Vega Baja, que se encuentran ya en diferentes fases de tramitación. Estos planes que tenemos en marcha y a los cuales ya ha hecho referencia al conseller Arcadia España en la inauguración del seminario, tienen fundamentalmente tres objetivos. La protección del medio ambiente con la consecuente mejora de la calidad del territorio y la salud de las personas por medio del desarrollo 
de la infraestructura verde, la cual se diseña para optimizar bienes y servicios ambientales en beneficio del conjunto de la sociedad. Diseñar también un modelo territorial, como decíamos, equitativo y resiliente, introduciendo los principios de la economía circular y potenciando las capacidades del territorio para generar valor y para reforzar procesos de innovación que también están apareciendo no solo en áreas metropolitanas, sino también en ciudades medianas y en el mundo rural. Por último, una apuesta por la movilidad sostenible descarbonizada, en la cual, de alguna manera, el uso del suelo esté ligado a la disponibilidad de movilidad en transporte público, potenciando un modelo donde la movilidad sea vista como un servicio y no como una servidumbre. Además, estamos impulsando una nueva generación de planes de acción territorial que ponen el foco en el sistema rural y que nos permitirán trabajar a una menor escala desde la ordenación estructural de estos municipios de menor población que necesitan un mayor acompañamiento por parte de las administraciones, lo cual nos tiene que permitir afrontar los retos que ya nos marcaba la Agenda Territorial 2020 respecto del mundo rural la carencia de oportunidades, el envejecimiento de la población, etc. Otra cuestión eh, que tenemos que afrontar es la de la gobernanza territorial, lo cual exige una clara voluntad política y una definición de ámbitos territoriales y funcionales reales y no meramente administrativos, dotándola de un marco legal que tendremos que trabajar eh, puesto que hay que buscar fórmulas innovadoras para mejorar la cohesión territorial. Hay que generar un marco eh, eficiente donde las inversiones adquieran carácter territorial porque el territorio importa y necesita un tratamiento específico en función de sus capacidades de generar procesos de innovación económica, social, cultural, etc. Por otra parte, la Comunidad Valenciana está impulsando también como despliegue de la Agenda Urbana Española y de la Europea la redacción de la Agenda Urbana Valenciana, que incluirá en el bloque temático correspondiente a territorio y ciudad, temas críticos como la resiliencia integral que nos permita afrontar situaciones adversas generadas, generadoras perdón, de graves impactos eh, resultantes de crisis originadas por fenómenos o procesos externos y que, se, y, 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 y que empeoran por debilidades endógenas que hacen el territorio especialmente vulnerable. La redefinición de lo urbano y lo rural y sus relaciones o el equilibrio territorial profundizando en la proximidad, en las relaciones sociales y económicas, equilibrando centralidades territoriales y consiguiendo relaciones de complementariedad, evitando la segregación, las desigualdades sociales en el territorio y entre el centro y la periferia. Afrontamos todos esos retos conscientes de la heterogeneidad que presenta el territorio valenciano, que a pequeña escala no deja de ser un reflejo de las diferencias que también encontramos en el marco territorial europeo. Pero lejos de considerar esta situación como un hándicap, lo entendemos como una oportunidad desde la diferencia, la complementariedad y la cooperación. En cierto modo, la comunidad valenciana ya ha detectado a escala local las preocupaciones que señala la Agenda Territorial Europea y ya ha abordado algunas de ellas, pero otras continúan siendo asignaturas pendientes. Por todo ello, son necesarios foros como este, donde se comparten las preocupaciones y la investigación para llegar a soluciones, donde aprendemos de las experiencias en otros territorios y de los proyectos piloto. Estos contactos tienen la importancia de reforzar la compartición de experiencias y la coordinación de políticas para aprender de las buenas prácticas territoriales. Desde la Generalitat Valenciana mantenemos en definitiva nuestro compromiso de continuar trabajando en el marco de nuestras competencias en ordenación del territorio desde el tratamiento integral de este, imprescindible para avanzar en el equilibrio territorial y avanzar totalmente alineados con las políticas de cohesión de la Unión Europea. Muchísimas gracias de nuevo a todas las personas expertas que han participado en esta jornada a través de esta ventana que tan acertadamente nos ha posibilitado la Cátedra Cultura Territorial Valenciana y Fundicor. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Inna. Muchas gracias, secretaria.
Bueno, pues vamos a proceder en este momento al cierre ya definitivo de la, del webinar. Esto es un punto y aparte, no va a ser un punto y final. Eh, tendrán ustedes, como les decía, a su disposición los materiales de, de, las, de las presentaciones y las, las intervenciones. Eh, tengo que disculparme nuevamente por no poder haber dado entrada a un par de preguntas pendientes de Leandro del Moral y de Charo la Tasa, pero en principio vamos a tratar de mantener esta esta línea de trabajo abierta y seguramente vamos a tener oportunidad de volver a encontrarnos todas aquellas personas, aquellos expertos desde la academia, desde la toma de decisiones, todos aquellos pensadores y también activistas o actuadores ¿no? responsables para la transformación de, del territorio que sin duda es el elemento central al cual debemos hacer referencia de cara a plantear la acción pública en los próximos años con toda esa programación que tenemos por delante. Muchísimas gracias a todos, a las autoridades que han participado en este evento, a los eh, compañeros, eh, amigos, colegas, expertos, ¿no? eh, que llevamos trabajando muchos de nosotros ya durante varias décadas en esta materia y que han, eh, se han sumado eh, de forma muy, muy, muy rápida ¿no? y muy fácil, nos han hecho fácil la organización de este, de esta, de este seminario eh, todos, los, eh, todos los ponentes que han, que han intervenido y esperamos que podamos seguir eh, trabajando y estableciendo y tejiendo esas redes de colaboración de lo cual pues tenemos eh, por delante meses ¿no? e incluso algún año para ir trabando eh, alianzas entre las administraciones, entre las administraciones, las universidades y entre administraciones, universidades y lo que es la sociedad civil en este, en este sentido y en esta dirección. Muchísimas gracias a todos y hasta muy pronto. Chao.